This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon and welcome to this sunset safari and this is a cloudy afternoon all the way from the Kruger National Park in South Africa. My name is Stefan Winterboer and this is Safari Live. Hello and welcome back after that. I always like those openings to be quite honest, they're quite nice. I don't always get them right, but that one felt like it was okay. We've got Senzo on camera this afternoon and uh, we've come into the area around Twin Dams for a couple of reasons, primarily of which is looking for a leopard. Uh, there was a young female leopard, which I'm presuming to be Shongile, that was seen around the end of Game Drive uh, this morning, around nine o'clock. She apparently was moving from Termite Mount to Termite Mount in this direction. And I'm hoping that we're gonna find her enjoying the late afternoon breeze and the sunshine. It's been a fairly hot day today, to be honest, but what's happened since this morning's lowered cloud is the fact that these puffy white clouds haven't gone anywhere and I think it's actually going to be quite interesting to see what they do overnight. The reason being is that it's going to cool down tonight and of course the drop in the dew point temperature might mean that these clouds come a bit lower and then they're going to start piling up against the Drakensberg and that means we're going to, we might be able to get some rain. So I'm hoping for that. They've predicted rain for tomorrow and so it's going to be quite interesting to see exactly what these puffy clouds bring in. Been a pretty hot day. Um, I don't really know if it's, if it's been, you know, out of the ordinary for this time of year. We're expecting it to be a little bit hotter, but, you know, I don't really know. Don't forget that you can ask us questions using the question bar on YouTube and on Twitter. And please do, we'll try and get through as many questions as we can. We're about as interactive as that. And uh, you can pretty much talk to me as and when you need to. As you can hear, I'm still suffering from consumption, but I don't feel too bad at all. Now, talking about World Animal Day, which was yesterday as far as I know, um, we have got, we're celebrating our version of World Animal Day with an animal every day, and today's animal of the day is elephant. And talking about elephant, we've got Jamie, who's got some all the way up in the Mara. I have elephant singular, but as Steph said, it is a day where we at Safari Live and Wild Earth are going to be celebrating elephants. So a very good afternoon to all of you and welcome to the Sunset Safari. For those of you that are new to these live safaris, my name is Jamie and this afternoon Jandre is on camera with me and we are live here in the Maasai Mara of Kenya. So while Steph goes off in search of leopards, lurking around twin dams we are actually going to make our way back to where we saw a tiny tiny little lion cub last night but i couldn't stop no oh, i couldn't resist stopping for this old gentleman elephant some of you i think will recognize him he spends a lot of time around here at the base of the escarpment where our road down from camp meets the mara and he's very, very easily recognizable. He spends lots of time here. Occasionally we see him hanging out with the ladies, but most of the time he's all by himself, <clears throat> as is relatively typical of a bull elephant of this age. He might occasionally have a male companion or two to keep him company, usually younger males, but for the most part he enjoys some time on his own. And this is a particularly marshy spot and since the rain hasn't come for the last I would say about two weeks now everything's starting to dry up it's starting to get quite dusty and he's taking full advantage of the remaining green grass around this area it's where all the water flows down from the escarpment and collects in this area he is very clearly identifiable though it's his tusks I think that make him so so easy to spot. 
One, both quite long, but one on the right much, much thicker than the other. Riti, uh, yes, a lone elephant could be attacked by a lion. A lion singular, no, and a big mature bull like this one, almost definitely not. But there are certain lion prides that do specialize in attacking and killing elephants, usually only when they're desperate at certain times of the year for something to feed on. And usually what you'll find is that they tend to go for the younger males, males that are away from a breeding herd, because it's much safer for them to try and target those young bulls, because there's less of a chance of somebody or one, some of the other elephants coming to the rescue. So although you might think logically that a, an elephant calf would be a good target, in fact there's no point in the lions trying to attack an elephant calf because the entire herd will band together to protect that little one. But a young male off on their own, it is a possibility, it will not be one lion, it will most definitely be more than one lion, probably around about between 10 and 15, even more than that, ideally, and then it's going to take a very, very long time. A big bull like this one, I would say, is not at risk especially not here in the Masai Mara, where the lions have plenty of easier meals to grab. There's baby Topi wandering about everywhere. There's lots of zebras around. It would be foolhardy to tackle a gentleman of this age. And most of the time you'll see the elephants wandering past without even giving the lions a second glance. Sometimes they go and chase them if they're a little bit too close. But otherwise, it is a peaceful existence free from the attentions of the apex predator out here. And don't forget, because this is a live safari, hashtag safari live is how you get your question answered, if there's something that you would like to know. You could also send through your comments. And as I said yesterday, puns always appreciated. Right, it's not just myself out here that would be rather silly in this massive area that we drive around in, in the Masai Mara. Brent is out as well. I don't know where he is, but I'm sure he'll tell you. Well, 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 we are out indeed. We are still way down south near the Tanzanian border. Uh, my name is Brent Leo Smith. I have Manu on camera. And in case you see a weird shadow jumping about, or if while we're filming the camera starts wobbling, we can of course just blame Taylor McCurdy, who's having a jolly on the back with us today. Um, and we've had a fantastic day so far. We haven't been home yet. Uh, we didn't plan on staying out all day, but we've we got to see those white hyenas quite late in the afternoon. I mean, in the morning. And, uh, and then we found a cheetah, but unfortunately he's disappeared now. Um, and uh, we still haven't quite given up on the chance of seeing mating cheetahs. So the, I spoke to some of the guys on the Tanzanian border from Tanzania. They're convinced the cheetahs are outside on the Kenyan side. Uh, and all the Kenyans are convinced the cheetahs are on the Tanzanian side. But remember, if you've got any questions for us, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Now, this is the area where we're going to go down into to look for the mating cheetahs. Oh yeah, we're just having a quick look. There's some elephants in the distance, some turbi. And um, Melissa is wondering, what animal in terms of mothers is the best at keeping their babies safe? Oof, that's quite a difficult question, Melissa. I mean, all mothers try. Succeeding is, is a different thing. Um, oh, I'm trying to think. Uh, possibly pangolin. They're quite good at keeping their babies safe. Um, but out of the big cats, they all have a very high mortality rate. But cheetah have by far the highest mortality rate. So out of the big cats, cheetahs, it's not that they're the worst mothers, they just can't really defend against um, the massive power difference between them and the other predators. Sorry, I've got so much dust up my nose, I must sound like this. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I couldn't even th uh, think there. But we're going to go trundle it down 
and head down towards the Tanzanian border again and then we're going to head down to an area called Military and to the Salt Licks where I actually haven't been to the Salt Lake in so long and maybe the Salt Lake pride is lining around there pining after the lack of wildebeest. Now speaking of a lack of wildebeest, actually let's just move the car for a second and show you. We, we've seen a crossing today as well unfortunately it was in one of the areas where we don't have the best signal but slowly but surely I've been seeing thousands upon thousands of wildebeest in Tanzania it looks like some on the border down there you see them there Manu I th and that was actually almost actually exactly where we saw uh, the white hyenas this morning and zebra oh, it's all zebras no wildebeest there Odd waterbuck. Can you spot a white hyena from this distance? <gasps> I hope so, but probably very unlikely. If the zebras are like ants, the hyena will be like baby ants. Now, we're in search of uh, the spotted cheetah. Steph is a few thousand kilometers to the south of us in search of a leopard. So, let's go see how he's doing. For a few um, brief days a year, all the apple leaves out here flower and we've got one flowering in splendid glory right now. This particular tree gets its name, gets its specific name Violencia from the flowers that you can see which are a beautiful colour. Now you can't see it at this angle because underneath they're the sort of mauvey colour but right up at the top of the flower they're a beautiful purple color and see if I can actually they shed them here I'm just gonna step out of my vehicle for one sec and pick up a few on the floor to show you there are a lot of them that lie on the floor and especially on a windy day like today they they drop off the trees so let's see if I can show you here yeah. there's the violet or the it's not a violet tree it's an apple leaf tree but have a look at those violet flowers beautiful hey those are the leaves and the flowers from the petals quite nice hey so that's the apple leaf trees flowers and they won't last very long at all they um they uh sorry i just need to plug myself in here they won't last very long at all they, um, they drop off very quickly and then disappear. So that's it for, there we go, a nice view. The apple leaf tree. So we are looking for leopard this afternoon. There was one seen in this particular area this morning. There's a daker. Lip, one of the leopard's favorite foods. Just sitting down there giving us a nice view. Common or gray dacre. And you can see from the small little horn that he has on his head, or two horns that he has on his head, that this is a male. A good looking male as well. Wow, that's a lovely picture. Quickly get your screenshots going. These animals don't stick around for long at all. This is in fact one of the longest sightings of a dacre I've had in ages. Now these little antelope are quite primitive in their body design and in their evolution and it's not uncommon for you to see them eating young birds, that ground nesting birds and lizards. They'll quite often trample lizards to death and then eat them. And they can to a degree augment their vegetable diet, mainly browsing, so leaves and twigs, with some meat from time to time. Wow, this is a fantastic sighting of a grey daika. Daika in Afrikaans means diver, and it is, they called that after their habit of ducking into the undergrowth, and like they dive through bushes. Very agile little things. They do get eaten by leopard a lot. Wow, look at this. Obviously, food has overcome his shyness in this particular sighting, giving us a, such a good view. Oh, he's picking up off the floor. Looks like something has fallen on the floor there. 
Francis, in Israel you say yes, such lovely big eyes. I must agree with you. Oh, fantastic. Usually you associate big eyes with, with nocturnal living. No need to go forward anyway. There we go. Maybe give us a bit of an idea of what, they, what it's eating. It's picking something up off the floor. And that round noise. Oh, that's a beautiful sighting of one. Very rare to see them like this, to be honest with you. They're very shy antelope. One of the dwarf antelope, we've got four dwarf antelope in this particular area, the grey diker, the steenbuck, the clipspringer, and what is the other one? My brain escapes me. Only three. Emka, you'd like to know what the black mark is near their eyes and is there is it any use to them? That, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the black mark that you're talking about is not their crest of hair on the forehead, but just below their eye they've got a pit-like structure which is called a pre-orbital gland and what they do is they insert sticks, males at least anyway, will insert sticks into that gland and leave an oily secretion on the stick and it's a, one of the ways that they mark their territory. There you go, you can see it there now just every now and again coming through. Brilliant camera work from Senza there. You can see it, there's a vertical slit underneath the eye. It's a pre-orbital gland and used to mark sticks with an oily secretion uh, that helps with identifying one male's territory from another. Oh, he's in good condition, eh? Very dainty, careful little antelope. Uh, the other dwarf antelope is the sharp buck, which you won't get here, but just close by here on the other side of the Kruger. So you get three of the, 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 the five dwarf antelope here. And this is one of them, probably one of the largest as well. There's that gland in full view. Moving around a bit, making it difficult. There you go. Look how brilliantly he blends into the grey trees and shrubs in the background. You can imagine if he was now in that bush in the thick summer, in the leaves, you'd hardly even see him. Um. Megan, could you just repeat Sheila's question? I missed the first part. Ah. So Sheila, you want to know if the good grass is hard to find for the sabi sand antelope. And no, no, not actually Sheila. In, this particular animal is a browser, which means it eats leaves and twigs, and that's what it's eating now. There's something dropping on the floor, probably from the tree above it. Most likely leaves from the knob thorn uh, that are pulled off from the tree above it. But to come back to your grass question, the best grass, one of the best grasses in Africa grows right here, the Peltiforum, uh, the Panicum Maximum. It's a grass that likes to grow in the shade of trees and grows all over this place in groves. It's a very, very healthy reservoir for Peltiforum, uh, excuse me, what Peltiforum, for Panicum Maximum grass or Guinea grass. And, um, and really, it's, it's, it's very easy to come by. Animals spend days walking around from thicket to thicket. All of this tall grass that you see here, this dry hay grass here underneath these trees, all of it is peltiforum. So everything that you're looking at over there is pelt of dry peltiforum grass. Makes for a good winter food, makes for an epic summer food, and animals from all over the place come here just for that. Lovely.
All right. So why don't we go and have a look at one of Jamie's antelopes that she's just found. The antelope have gone. I'm sorry I drove past them. But the reason that I drove past them will become apparent in a few seconds. Because we've gone past our antelope, in that case with some elant and some topi, to come and have a look at an endangered bird species. Something that I really enjoy sitting and spending a bit of time with. Now Tristan had the most phenomenal few days actually spent with a hornbill family, a ground hornbill family, a couple of weeks ago. They really are fascinating birds. And we've got a lovely little group here. You can see the juvenile on the left with the underdeveloped bright, well, underdeveloped dark facial patch complete contrast to that of the, the parents and the adults that have very well developed red patches around their face and a sort of a an a, a bulge around the base of their of their bill there you go there's an adult for comparison and if you look really closely it's a bit tricky to see from here but if you look really closely you might even be able to see under one of their bills there will be a blue spot or a bluish spot that will tell us that it is in fact a female rather than a male. So for our new viewers, this is a southern ground hornbill. I said that it is a rare bird. It is endangered. They are one of the bird species that is incredibly threatened throughout Africa. So every time we see them, we stop and appreciate their beauty and of course just how privileged we are to see them. The biggest threat, as with most creatures out here, is loss of habitat. And they're very picky birds. They build nest sites that they then use regularly, year after year after year. And when that nest site gets destroyed, they get very unhappy. And they then refuse to breed for a considerable period of time. I knew of a pair of birds that wouldn't breed for three years after their nest site was destroyed by lightning. Umkar, yes, they are genetically related to the other hornbills. Uh, they, there is also another ground hornbill known as the Abyssinian ground hornbill. And of course, I'm just trying to think if I had my bird book with me. I don't because I'm in the wrong car today. I thought I was going to be in Quito, but Brent did not return. He went out this morning and didn't come back. So I, my bird book sitting in the car. But yes, they are... Let me see if I can find a picture. They are genetically similar to the hornbills that we see. I'm so desperate to show you a, a black and white casked hornbill. It would be... It's been on my wish list for ages. I know Taylor... Taylor's come the closest to managing a good hornbill sighting. I haven't managed it yet. Nearly did. James, you're wondering about if we ever put bands on the hornbills to see where they go to. I confess to not knowing the answer to that here in Kenya. I haven't seen any bands around the ankles of the hornbills. I can tell you that in Kruger it's very common practice. They are the population of ground hornbills in South Africa is monitored by an organization known as the Mubula Ground Hornbill Project. And they tag the various birds and what you'll find is it'll be either left foot or right foot for male or female depending and occasionally different colors for where those birds have been released. Now, I don't know if the same process is done here. I know in the Kruger they encourage guests to report sightings of those tagged birds. I'll try and find out for you. Just out of curiosity I'll try and find out. There must be somebody somewhere researching a ground hornbill in Kenya. So I'll see what I can do. And while I ponder that and go and see whether or not these guys have any bands around their legs, let's go across to an antelope that has bands around its body and is considered to be one of the most beautiful. And in the shadows, we have a bull nyala, one of the most striking antelope in this particular area. Now, we do see them fairly frequently, but they never cease to amaze me, actually, to be honest. 
I love them. And just like that diker that we saw a little bit earlier, these are also browsers. They also eat leaves and twigs. And we also found this one with its nose on the floor. I wonder what it is that is enticing them to feed off of the floor. To me, it must be something that is dropping off the trees, either flowers or seed pods or leaves that have been shaken off in the wind. See those yellow socks on his feet? Shaggy coat. Lots of different colors, stripes and patterns all over the place. Jenny Animation, you say you're very excited to see a Nyala. That sounds like you've got a story about Nyala. Please share it. Don't be so shy. What do you like so much about the Nyala? Is it its shaggy coat? Is it the fact that it's actually quite a rare antelope to see? They only rarely occur here. What are you licking your chops like? How long is that thing's tongue? Wow. That was almost licking to the top of its head. Walks off into the bushes. Now, Laurie, you'd like to know if they get summer fur. Uh, Laurie, no, they stay that they stay that shaggy for the year round. It doesn't. The, te the temperature gets hot here, and there's a, about a, in terms of Celsius. There's about a 20 degrees uh, fluctuation between winter and summer temperatures here. Um, in degrees Celsius, but it's not hot or cold enough to warrant them actually shedding a coat and getting a new coat at all. Um, and so, no, the, the answer to that is no, they stay like that. They will thin their coat out a little bit if it gets really, really hot. And if it gets really cold, they'll thicken it up a little bit. But for the most part, uh, no, it, uh, it's the, it's the same, same shagginess the whole time. It really gives them a lovely appearance out here. One of the very few antelope, barring, I suppose, the water buck with a shaggy coat. Now I just need to go on to the radio here quickly, which is going to be a little bit jarring. And we've got a car in front of us and I want to know what he's doing. I think he's wary of us. He can see us filming and he wants to know if he can pass or not. So, uh, station uh, static on Elephant Skull, come in for Steph. Oh, good afternoon. Uh, so I'm just on the road, we were just doing a segment to the Nyala, if you're interested. Ah, so my partner in crime has said he's just looking at a Nyala as well. Uh, yeah, we did. Um, I didn't check both sides of the dam or north on the southern side of the dam. Uh, so, excuse me, or west on the southern side of the dam. I was planning on making my way around uh, the main road. So that's Andrew, one of the colleagues. And what we do is we communicate with one another and we try and cover as much ground as we can and therefore hopefully uncover anything that we can. We both in the area looking for uh, this leopard uh, that was seen this morning and hopefully we can cover more ground, see tracks going somewhere, help coordinate a bit of movement, send out a bit of a net. Of course you've only got a limited time with us and we want to show you as much as what we possibly can in that three hours. Um, and so we're going to carry on over here. They've, uh, they've, our Nyala has gone. Their Nyala might still be there, which will give us a chance to, uh, to have a look at the Nyala while we wait for, um, while we wait to see what the bush has to say about uh, where these cats have gone. And by that I mean the bush, generally speaking, will let us know where a leopard is. Monkeys calling, impala barking, kudus calling. Uh, Christine, you'd like to know if the horns on all antelope species continue to grow throughout their lifetime. And um, the answer to that is, hmm, yes, although they won't always increase in length. They'll get to a certain length, maybe a little bit longer as they get older, then they'll increase in thickness. 
and they might even increase in width apart, but definitely, <coughs> excuse me, definitely uh, not get longer than past a certain point. Hello, some guests in front of us. Um, now, what I mean by past a certain point, obviously hunters have been pri prizing um, antelope with long horns, um, but you find that the variation between a non-record antelope, whatever that's supposed to mean, and a record antelope, um, is sometimes quite small, with the exception of buffalo, of course, um, or some or other type of genetic anomaly that, uh, that uh, creates some abnormality um, and massive horn length like that. So a kudu, for instance, will get a much, will get a, will get a deeper, thicker horn, and that'll increase the the the, the um, depth of its curl. In other words, widen it. That'll increase the horn length, but not past a certain point from its head. There's a, it's going to be difficult this one, but there's a chin spot battus in the tree here. A little bird at the top. They tend to stick around for a little bit. Let's see if we can get him just bouncing from one side to another. A beautiful little bird. Uh, he's still there in the opening on the right, in the center of the tree. Go right, punch in, go right a bit more, right. There we go, punch in the center. There he is, no? Ah, they're in the middle there, still. Don't worry, we're hunting for it. It was a difficult, it was going to be a difficult fight. And uh, so those for the bird list for today, we're looking at a chin spot batis. Ah, you can see it. There you go. There we go. Well done, Senzo. You'll see that beautiful little eye. If he just sticks his head forward here now. Come on, show us your eye. Get a, uh, gone. Well, that was a chin spot batis, everyone. I'm glad that we eventually got to see it. It's actually quite a difficult bird to see, to be honest. They're always in these thick things over here, in these thick bush. Tanith, you'd like to know all the way from Canada, what bird lives the longest? That's an interesting question. Um, I would probably say one of the bigger, bigger eagles, perhaps even an ostrich, um, a parrot. They all live around about 30 to 40 years, you know. These big birds, these big birds of prey have got the most unbelievable uh, longevity. So I'd say they're probably one of the big eagles, martial eagle or batelier, um, potentially even an ostrich, although an ostrich leaves a pretty high stress life. I don't think that he, uh, easily at least anyway, um, live to be a ripe old age or something's going to eat it. But why don't we see what, uh, you know, what knowledge is out there and if you know of an African bird or indeed any bird in the world that lives to be the oldest, why don't you share it with us and I'll share it with everybody else. My, my gut feel will say that it's probably one of the bigger raptors um, or an ostrich, um, potentially a ground hornbill, southern ground hornbill, but we're looking at between 40 and about 60 years of age for the oldest birds on the planet. What a high energy afternoon, you know, when these, when the weather changes like this and we start to get uh, winds coming in, bringing clouds and rain, things tend to hunker down and they, they're almost like they go to ground. Elephants don't like it, moves too much, rhino don't like it, moves too much, buffalo tend to just corral together and go to sleep. Leopard. Leopard. We got a male leopard in front of us. We found one. <laughs> We've got a leopard hunting something. Well done, Mr. Senza. That was luck, eh? <laughs> Senza is going, leopard, leopard. I'm thinking he's talking about what color underwear he's got on. Meanwhile, he's. Uh, <laughs>
Ich hatte sie gar nicht mehr That was a good fun. Wow. Well done. He definitely was hunting something. I wonder if she, something didn't come down to drink. I didn't see anything when we drove in here. Now, I'm not very good at identifying these cats, so if any of you knows what leopard this is, please feel free to tell me. Give me a couple of minutes and I'm sure I'll fathom it out, but uh, if any of you are quick on the trigger, you're welcome to let me know. Why are you being so skittish? Boy, what's the story with you? Let's see who this is. Senzo says he thinks it's Hosanna. It is a Hosanna. Why are you being so skittish, boy? What's the story? Oh, he is getting big, hey? Hello there, my boy. So, thank you very much for helping us confirm what leopard this is. This is Hosanna, and he is a leopard cub, well, sub-adult leopard cub, so to say. A beautiful shot of him drinking there, slaking his thirst. Good afternoon, my man. There we go. Now leopard will, they don't need to drink, but they will drink when they can. And he feels a bit, I think he feels a bit intimidated drinking here. I think they are in an exposed place. And you might find that he's having a bit of a wrestle with another leopard, potentially Tamba, maybe another male leopard in this area. Potentially there's some lions in this area. It's quite difficult to say what was making him so timid. Of course, these young leopards do, from time to time, do get a little bit timid. This is one of their things. Now, Francis, you say he's, you, this seems like it's his favorite spot, as we see him at Twin Dams quite often. Francis, yeah, I have to agree with you there. He, um, he does seem to like this spot. Leopard are if nothing else, uh, creatures of habit. And, um, and him being a cub at this point will hang around here for a couple of months while he explores. This is where his mom brought him when he was very young. I don't know if you remember when they were just born, his mom used to hide him in a road culvert close to here. So this would be the core of her territory, a place where he is intimately familiar with he knows where the big trees are, he knows where to get water, he knows where the impala are. And, uh, and until he's comfortable and confident, he's not going to easily move out of this area. That's beautiful. And so we will, for the next couple of months, probably find him. He'll be in and around this area. This area you can move through pretty quickly, and so he'll be in and around here. He looks like he's got a fairly full tummy as well. H. Macy, you just made a comment that I think everybody will agree with. You're saying our little prince is growing up to be such a big boy. And uh, I think everyone will agree with you on that one. He is turning into a beautiful leopard, isn't he? Uh, it's interesting with him in that his fathers are, are well, his father is a, a dominant male in this area that probably within the next two years or so will reach the end of his reign here. And he's, he doesn't stand the chance of being killed, he just stands the chance of being ousted by another young male. And I wonder if he's going to kick Hosanna out of this territory before he realizes he's losing his grip on it. You can hear the Egyptian geese warning everything that he's here, and they're swimming now towards him. He'll catch and kill them if he can. He won't risk it now, but he will if he can. Yo, 
Leo is having a long drink, eh? Very thirsty. Been a hot day. Didn't look like he had eaten anything big uh, last night. His belly wasn't full full. The other day when we shared it with him, he was hunting a lot. Francis in Israel, you just wanted to know why do wild, large wild cats like this not have slitted pupils like a, like a house cat would? That's a good question. Um, I don't actually know the answer to that question, to be honest. I mean, I can help, I can try and reason it out. I mean, I don't know if this is going to be right or not, but. No, I don't actually know. I mean, it's got to do with the amount of light that goes into their eye, but of course, they can limit that with a very small pupil. And a slitted eye opening up wide is the same as a round eye opening up wide. It's like today's a question. Today's a day where I'm asking you all more questions than what you're asking me. And see if there's any literature out there in the broader world on why large cats have round pupils and not slitted pupils or if nothing else what is the advantage of a slitted pupil over a round pupil let's see what everyone says <laughs> he's got his mother's face that's for sure Now, I am just going to, if you'd excuse me for a couple of seconds, I'm just going to call in Andrew. He uh, He's looking for a leopard this afternoon, and I did say that I'd help. We were just lucky enough to find, and I don't want to disappoint him. So excuse me while I'm on the game drive radio. Uh, Andrew, come in for Steph. The sun's now coming out on him. He's looking beautiful, isn't he? Uh, Andrew, Andrew, Steph. No answer just yet, so we'll give him a few minutes. He's probably talking to his guests. And what are you going to do now, boy? Going to go back to hiding somewhere. See, he's again just sneaking up. I wonder if he's not worried about these geese giving his uh, his position away. Typically leopard using the lowest point possible to access. There he goes and sneaks again. No, he is a bit more confident. I'm going to change position. you've helped us with the answer to the question about the slitted pupil thank you you say that a slitted pupil helps with vertical focus which is specifically good when hunting for birds up in the sky and also for prey that's much smaller than them that's very interesting so thank you very much for that cow that's uh, that's nice of you to do that so wow that is interesting and of course because leopard hunt fairly large prey on the ground mostly they don't need it as do lion Let's see if we can get you a nice shot of him with the sun on the side of his face for you. And you can keep this one for the record books. Uh, Andrew, Andrew Steph. Andrew, please make your way to Twin Dams. I have a young male leopard on the dam wall. Uh, stations, two vehicles in this position, myself and Andrew. And Andrew, when you get here, if you wouldn't mind taking over. Uh, 
Uh, you're welcome, Orbs. You'll be the third station in this particular position. And this animal slowly may be making his way just off to the side of the dam wall. Sorry, everybody. I just needed to do a bit of admin. And uh, it's necessary, Archer. You know, everybody helps everybody here. And today we were lucky enough to find him and, uh, and, uh, and basically um, they'll help us again when they need to. Uh, you're welcome to, if you wouldn't mind just with your name. Excuse me, it's been a long time since I've been on the radio. Copy that. You're welcome to, Shaw. Thank you very much. So, on a day like today where you have uh, relatively few animals moving around, a leopard would draw a lot of attention from everybody around here. And, uh, and there is no doubt that he is, going to, uh, he is going to draw some attention from our colleagues here today. Ah. Chatla, you wanted to know what color the leopard's eyes are. They're like a greeny color, a greeny blue color. He's sitting close, close enough now that we can see. Oh, come on, look at us. There you go. That is beautiful. And you'll see they're like a greeny, yellowy, topazy color. They're the most beautiful colors, I must be honest with you. Oh, that's lovely, hey. Look at that. Lovely screenshot, everybody. Any whiskers. Oh, that is lovely. All those ears giving away his mood. And he puts his ears back, puts his ears forward. Long tail stretched out behind him, just sitting on his bum. Now, Richard, you'd like to know how fast he can run. Um, at short bursts, he can do up to 80 kilometers per hour, um, and just a little bit faster than that, even up to 88 kilometers an hour. What that is in miles per hour, I'm not too sure, but he can absolutely uh, do sprint at that speed for very fast. Oh, very short spaces of time. Gee whiz. Hold on, guys. I just need to sort out this radio. It's going crazy in my ear. Excuse me, everybody. I'm, I'm so out of practice with, uh, with um, these radios that when somebody's speaking in my ear while I'm trying to make and finish a sentence, I feel like my sentences goes into uh, a rhyme. <laughs> so excuse me if my words are coming out all garbled. <laughs> it's been a never-ending stream of chatter on the radio. Uh, Aubrey, Steph, if you wouldn't mind taking over this particular position, please, uh, you have Andrew on approach and Shaul on standby. There we go. I've handed over the responsibility of talking to Andrew, I mean to Aubrey, and that means that I can carry on my conversation with you without uh, without worry of being my brain being hijacked by, by radio communications. <laughs> Look at his tail, the tip of his tail. Now, that white that you see there, that's what a cub would see. And following mom and using small little movements like that, you, he will be communicated to by his mom. It's called a following mechanism. Most animals have it. And he would have had his mother signaling to him from a young age, just like that in his face. And they're very sensitive to mood changes. The tip of his tail is very sensitive to mood changes. Just look at that fantastic coat color that he has from the back. Along the spine and across the hip region has to be one of my favorite areas. 
Laurie, you'd like to know if a leopard's tail is longer than his body. That's actually a good question, Laurie, sir. So give me one second. I'm going to tell you the exact answer to that. I almost think it is, but there's a, there's a ratio of how much longer it is. So I'm going to just go through my book here, but it, it, it definitely... 282... Let me just see if I can answer you that question for you. Um... Uh, it doesn't say. I feel like I've read it somewhere before, to be honest with you. Tail 60 to 110 centimeters. Oh no, that's tall. Okay, so it's not in my one book that I have. I almost feel that it is longer him than, than, than him. So let's just say that it is for now, until I can go through my books here and find out where I've had that reference to uh, to um, to exactly how much longer it is. What are you doing, boy? He's now walking through the sticks. It's almost like he wants to stay hidden. has asked the question of questions. Do leopard, um, are leopards more comfortable on the ground or up in trees? That is a question, Melissa, that I, I've tried to answer for years myself. I don't actually know. They, they walk around a lot and I think they walk around because they have to. They've got to get from one place to another. They've got to, um, they've got to hunt. They've got to mark their territory. I wonder what he's trying to hunt there. Look, his ears are flat. Oh, he's going to go and lie down. Good for you. At least he's not walking across the boundary. Um, but given the chance, leopard will climb trees. And when they're younger, which is where I think you can find out what gives a leopard joy or not. In other words, does he like it or doesn't he? When they're young, leopard will bound from tree to tree and spend a lot of time in trees themselves. And it's there that I wonder that, uh, that, that these cats don't have a... A joy for it. It's difficult to say actually because you know who knows. But I'm just gonna go forward a little bit more. I don't want to him in him 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 no, that's a touch. I don't want to get too close basically on a skinny damn wall is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> the English escapes me. Oh, he's a good looking boy. So, Jamie is busy looking for cats rather than having found some at this point. Why don't you go over to her quickly for an update? <laughs> Step rubbing it in a little bit there. We are indeed looking for cats instead of finding them. Fair enough, fair point. We're actually... I, I'm having a little moment. I'm, I'm a little irritated. I'm trying not to be because, I mean, I set off very jolly this afternoon. It's just that the roads just didn't logically take me where I wanted to go and then I ended up on one that was actually closed but it wasn't closed. So we've taken a little bit longer to get to where I wanted to get to. My plan was always to, to do a loop around just in case she was somewhere close to the den but not at the den itself. It hasn't paid off though and it ended up being a far bigger loop. Oh, apparently Steph is comforting us by saying that we'll find the cats. We will. We will indeed. As soon as I find the road to the den site. Which will happen eventually. Wasn't quite expecting to have, it, have to go all the way around. But my own fault. It's the problem with this hat when it starts to when the wind starts to blow. Question coming through, speaking of our search for lions and of course Steph having one leopard, Francis in Israel 
Um, I'm just having one of those days. Oh, no, I don't have a hard copy. I just... <laughs> it's usually open. Um, yes, leopards roar as well. Hey buddy, Jumbo! Um, yes, leopards roar. Um, and in fact, all of the big panthera cats actually can roar. So, leopards, um, lions, and tigers as well. I'm going to try and sort us out, never mind. Have I, have I misunderstood something here? Okay. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and figure out how to get through the gate and then send you over to Steph, who is, of course, still with his a cat in the hand, so to speak. And I'll figure out what's happening here. I didn't mean to insult Jamie there at all, actually. She's a much, much better cat finder than I am and enjoys them a lot more than I do as well. I, um, while I enjoy watching leopard and obviously lion, and we spend lots of time with them, my, uh, my interest lies with the smaller things in this bush. So now I hear that there's a bit of wind um, that, is, that you can hear, and it's because I just need to turn, turn my body position away from the wind. That should be a little bit better for you, and um, it's because the wind is busy picking up now where we are and puffing out of the south blowing these clouds away it looks like not getting any thicker which is unfortunate because i thought that they were going to bring some rain which they might still do but for now it looks like we're going to have a lovely full moon rising over a blustery windy dry october bush felt he's just lying surveying his domain Melissa, you want to know if we often hear leopards roaring in the wild? Uh, yes, Melissa, actually we do. It's quite a common thing to hear leopards roaring. I mean, by common, I mean maybe once or twice a night. Uh, if you're really listening, for it, you'll hear a leopard roaring. And then when a leopard's close by, a particular dominant male or female in any particular area, and they're close by, you will hear them roaring. Um, sometimes when a leopard's on patrol, they'll roar every five to ten minutes or so and you'll hear them patrolling through an area, sawing up and down. And then every time I've slept on the banks of a river in Africa, I've always heard a leopard roar, you know, in a wilderness area, of course, not, uh, not everywhere, but sleeping on the banks of a, of a river in Africa in a wilderness area is almost certain to allow you to listen to a leopard roar. It's a very distinctive noise. Um, it's it's akin to sawing wood is what it's uh, what it's what it's uh, likened to I had lots of recordings of leopard roaring on uh, on the internet go and hear one and see what you think I think if you use a bit of imagination it definitely does sound like someone sawing a rough plank of wood I've just asked the question at what point do male leopards start mating? They'll be sexually mature at about two and a half years old, but they'll only really be able to vie for territory and therefore prove their virility and dominance and strength to a female, which makes them attractive to her from about five to seven years old. So though at two and a half years old he'll be sexually mature, he will only really be able to to mate from about or in an area where there's a lot of leopard 
Uh, he'll only really be able to mate from about five or seven. In an area like the Sabi Sands here, which is a very high population of leopard, uh, he'll probably be closer to oh, five or maybe uh, seven, I'm going to say, before he fathers his first litter. Unless, of course, something untoward happens and he's able to take over an empty territory uh, with, a f with a female around. You can see those ears working overtime. The reason for that is because of this wind. If you look just behind his right ear, you'll see there's a white tip to it. That is very similar to the white point to the end of the tail, which is used to accentuate movement of that particular appendage and therefore help and aid in communication to especially cubs at the back of them. So we haven't yet deciphered out the language of leopard, but it is known, and you can see it, that they use very subtle changes in body, in, um, in their body language, specifically their ears and their tail, and combinations of that to communicate with their cubs and each other, actually. Yo, your skin is in good condition there. Eh? Very good looking cat, this. Nothing like that. See if he wants to lie down, it looks like, hey. You can see that muscle in his forearm. Now that it's not close to his body, you can see how much muscle mass is actually there. Now Sam, you want Sans, you want to know if the leopard if a leopard's father could kill his own son if they meet Oh there we go, he's gonna lie down. Um, if the leopard's father will kill his own son if they meet around a kill, I suppose, or in the dark. Um no, I don't think so. Leopard approach each other very cautiously and because they're so vigilant, it's actually quite difficult to sneak up on a leopard. Um, they do do it from time to time. It's not uncommon for leopard to be, um, not cannibalized, but killed by, uh, by other leopard. And... Uh, but I don't think a father and a son, it would make no sense. So they do take their time to greet one another. And when they meet each other in the when they meet each other in the in in the dark, I think they take their time to make sure that they're not going to do that. He will a male leopard will kill cubs. Tingana is well known for killing cubs. Uh, especially of other leopard. And I think it, they do it to force females into estrus again. And, uh, excuse me. And um, therefore sire as many of their own cubs as they possibly can. He's having some fun, this leopard, just relaxing on the dam. James, you say, let's hope Tingana, talking about leopards and dads and fathers, and let's hope that Tingana does arrive. Tingana, for those of you who don't know, is, uh, is um, this young leopard. He's called Hassana's dad. And he is the dominant, one of the dominant males in this area. He shares the territory with a leopard called Mvula. And um, 
when he comes around camp, he roars his lungs out. So if he's around, we definitely will know about it. Those ears just listening to it. Ah, oh, awesome. I'm told that Brent has some bat-eared foxes, which you just have to go and have a look at. Ah. Brent is not, we're not going to show you the bat-eared foxes just yet, excuse us. Brent's signal is so choppy where he is that as soon as we wanted to go to him, um, he decided that his camera wouldn't work. So Brent's just going to get himself into a better position and let's hope that he can find some signal around those bat-eared foxes for you. For now, you with me and we are looking at Hosanna, this young male leopard who is just new into adulthood, well, sub-adulthood. He's not quite two and a half years old yet, so sub-adulthood and enjoying this late afternoon sun and wind that is coming in. Crab, cat, mama, you just asked what is the life expectancy of a leopard in the wild? Um, it is probably between uh, 12 and 16 years uh, with leopard in captivity in zoos and safari parks and that it being slightly more um, than that. But between 12 and 16 years old is, is normally the lifespan of, of a cat. With them being sexually mature, two and a half two and a half years, sexually active from about five to about seven years and dominant in the territory right up until they are 14 or 15 years old. Uh, and so fathering and, and, and bearing uh, litters of leopards for a long time of their life. And they will have anywhere from about two to six cubs. Uh, they'll successfully normally only rear one or two. It's rare to see more than that. One leopard female can't provide enough food usually and anything more than two cubs uh, don't survive for very long. It is, it is known. Uh, I've seen once a leopard with three, three youngsters. The most leopard I've ever seen together has been five. Uh, with a mom and her three babies and a male in the same tree at the same time feeding on an impala. Does it Sabi Sabi here in the Sabi Sands? Property just to the south of us here. And will happen at other places in the Sabi Sands as well. The, uh, the mortality rate of leopard here is high, but it's not as high as it is outside the game reserve. Leopard and lion do quite well in these protected areas, whereas Cheetah and leopard do well outside the protected areas. Uh, leopard generally do well everywhere, I think. They found almost from, well, actually, they found from Cape Town all the way north uh, through Africa, throughout Africa, east to west, and then all the way into India, all the way across the uh, Asian continent to the Amur leopard, right down on the, um, the eastern side of China. Jamie's luck has finally paid out and uh, she's got something cool to show you. I've got many cool things to show you and in fact I've just realized apart from the two vultures that are on the top of the tree we actually had two lionesses at the base of it but the second one has just got up and moved behind the foliage. So there we go one of these two 
is the mother of that brand new cub that we saw for the first time yesterday evening on the sunset safari. The second lioness just moved across to the left, but unfortunately I think she's... Oh, is there a cub there? No, most definitely not. I was hoping that perhaps the lioness was suckling. Oh, definite suckle marks. That's mum. And that is a really... I, and I wish we could be closer, but unfortunately she's on the wrong side of... Oh, there's another little cub. That was a surprise. Okay, so there's new, new cubs, and then there's slightly older cubs. Judging by that level of coordination, that cub that just danced past definitely was not the one that we saw last night. The one that we saw last night was much, much younger than that. That little one that went dashing past, I think, looked about, in that brief instant that I saw it, about four or five weeks old. Maybe even a little bit older. Come back. Come back, little cub. Well, this mom is definitely showing signs of suckle marks, but now the fact that there is a second set of cubs confuses matters, because now we don't know exactly which mum it will be. Now, I don't know which lionesses these are. I said yesterday I thought they might be the Olololos. We're not far from the little governor's gate at all, as you may or may not have noticed. Some of you must have had a good chuckle at the fact that I didn't notice the boom go up behind me while I was staring at the camera. Somebody must have had a good laugh. There's the Olololo gate over there. Oh, Chandre, sorry, I know we're looking at the lioness. There's Mayer's parrots over there. Hmm, are you seeing the rollers? I know the parrots just, just went in behind this tree. And now they've, they've settled I think where we can't view them. Come back, parrots. Ah. Oh. I've forgotten what the East African name for them is. It's the same thing as a mayor's parrot. That is a lilac-breasted roller. That is a lilac-breasted roller. Come back, parrots. Oh, there we go, there we go, there we go, there we go. Did you see it flutter out there? Okay, if you go to the left of the roller and down, there. It's about in the center of your screen, somewhere around there. Um, there it is. There we go. There you go. Awesome. Thank you, Jandre. Oh, what is this, the East African name for them? I can't remember. We call them Mayer's parrots. Let me just check quickly. I don't know my bird book. If you know what they call them here, and I do apologize for not remembering, what the different name is for them here. I think it's brown. I think it is brown parrots. Hello. I know we've been talking about lion cubs and we have a lioness, but she's very far away and I had to show you this bird. And of course, you've been talking about long-lived birds with Steph. Nice little connection there because, of course, parrots live for a considerable period of time as well, especially the larger ones. See the little yellow spot on the top of its head? Cool. Fantastic. Thanks, Chandre. I very much would like, want to get that particular bird on camera. We're going to take one last look at this lioness, and then we're actually going to start moving. I've got to meet up with Brent so that we can do a bit of a switchover. So I'm going to have to start moving in his direction, and he's going to have to start moving in mine. But let's quickly have a look at this lioness, and then if we manage, we'll get back here before the end of the sunset safari. Trust me, I'd love to stay and wait for her to go and fetch her cubs. The den site is about mm, 50 yards away from where she is. No, maybe 100 yards away from where she is lying now. And there's a very good chance with those cubs being as tiny as they are that she's going to go back to them and feed them at some point soon. The younger they are, the shorter the lioness, or the shorter the periods of time that the lionesses will leave them. Melissa, I've never ever experienced it or seen it. 
um, and I'm not sure whether anybody else has either. I think that the natural instinct for the lioness is to be by herself. So Melissa's saying that she knows that the lioness takes herself off when it's time to give birth, but will they ever go off in pairs and give birth at the same time? While it's very possible to have... Oh, here comes a cub. Here we go. Come on, little one. Out you come. We want to get to know you. While it's very possible for lionesses to have cubs of very similar ages or give birth very close together, it is unlikely that their instinct, they might den close to each other. Oh, hello. Here we go. <laughs> Best chew toy in the world. Oh, until mom gets fed up and moves away. I wonder how many lions are in there. It <laughs> would be really nice to know, wouldn't it? There's at least two lionesses and at least two cubs. Come on. Aren't you come, you little reprobate? Let's get an idea of how old you are. So no, they won't go and use the exact same densite. Remember the hormones, the maternal instinct, everything is more likely. <laughs> Cute. Why wouldn't you come and jump in this direction? Well spotted, Jandre. Ah, oh. oh, there comes another one, and there goes another one. There we go. Okay, a little bit older than I think I thought initially. Quite coordinated. Now remember that maternal instinct, it tends to make those females very, very solitary. Oh, sweet, there's just a little foot there. Let me try go back. Let's see if this would maybe help us. Where's the road? There's the road. No. Yeah. Oh, you got him. But forward. Oh, I see the gap there. Okay. Let's have a look. I'll adjust as we go along. Okay. One, two, three, four. Everybody agree with me about four of them? As we enjoy a last glimpse of these lion cubs for now, trust me, I really don't want to have to leave, but I have to. Let's go across to Steph, who finds himself in, well, I guess it's safe to say that he finds himself in a really rather similar position. All right, and Hassan has gotten moving. It looks like he's decided that it's cool enough for him to move off and uh, go and look for something. An interesting character, this, you know. He's developing a proper, a proper attitude. I mean, a character, and it's just, it's nice to see. You know, young leopard to have a look at these, uh, to have a look at, uh, at the way that they develop is just, it's very interesting. And experiences definitely shape they um, definitely shape the way that they, uh, they experience things. I don't know where he's going to go now. Is he just up there? Uh, Very cautious. <laughs> Excuse me for one second. Uh, Sally for Steph, you're welcome to make your way in. I'll stand by on the dam wall and uh, there's Tex and Mike in the lock. As expected, uh, the sighting has generated such a lot of interest. So, for now, what we're going to do is we're going to let Hosanna walk off into the grass. And uh, what we'll do is keep tabs on what this leopard is doing. And basically, if he sticks around and doesn't cross over the boundary, then we'll come back. For now, he is heading straight south, and that's going to make a few people that have been wanting to see him 
a little bit upset, but you know, some some you win, some you lose, and I think we had uh, the lion's share of fantastic sighting there for sure. On to bigger and better things. Now, what do you, do you like to see more? Uh, to be honest, I um, want to go into Mumba Road. Now, I didn't do it. You want to see? You wanted to ask, have I ever seen a big cat depressed in the wild? Did I get that right? Uh, Megs, a, a, a big cat depressed in the wild. Um, wow, what a question. I've never been asked a question like that before. I don't think that... Can an animal de be depressed? I suppose they could. I mean, it's all just chemicals in, the, in, in your body or the lack of certain chemicals and mixtures. And I suppose they could be, they could be uh, depressed. Will it manifest in the same way that depression manifests in, in humans? Probably not. We're quite a deep thinking species with uh, a large imagination. Um, and I think that depression to a degree, although can be chemically induced, um, is also, uh, what is that? Uh, we still, um, is to a large degree uh, also assisted or, or uh, exaggerated by an overactive imagination or an, imag an imagination. Um, I've seen zoo animals depressed, uh, in particular leopard and lion. You sometimes see them in the zoos and safari parks that I used to frequent as a youngster. Um, and I always thought to myself, they look a bit depressed. Have a look at this. This next to the condor is the bird on earth with the largest wingspan. It's a marabou stork. That wingspan from tip to tip is seven foot. The bird is about as tall as I am if it had to really stretch itself out. And that wingspan, seven foot from tip to tip. Isn't that just unbelievably awesome? battling a little bit in this wind. I think it wants to come in and land. Uh, being this big, their wings generate a lot of lift. And he's going to have to time it perfectly so as not to crash. So come in slow enough to aim at what he's doing and then stall just close enough to the tree to make his legs land. Quartering through the wind. That's lovely. Must be quite difficult to fly, actually. Now, Alice in the FC at Namara. Hello, good afternoon, Alice. You say it's so weird to see these birds fly because they're such big and ungainly birds. They absolutely are. Let's turn the car around a bit and see how long we can follow this Marabou stalk for. might land here at the dam. Or it may not and just carry on flying very slowly. Now flying into the wind. I wonder where you're going. Why go to all the effort of quartering through the wind like this? Actually, double check my facts on its wingspan. Awesome. Ah. So Tanith and Amanda have given us some answers as to what birds live the longest 
And there's some records that they've managed to find saying that an albatross, one of the albatross, lives the longest at 60 years. So thank you very much to Tanith for that. Um, excuse me, Tanith and Megan, won't you just repeat our second viewer's name that helped us with that? Um, Tanis and Amanda. So thank you very, very much for helping us with that. So it's about 60 years for an albatross. An albatross, of course, is a massive bird and big birds tend to live a bit longer. And as we predicted, around about 40 to 60 years with the oldest one living to about 60 years. I would imagine that the eagles here are anywhere from about 40 to 50 years. Ah, and wow, Tris, uh, says that an Australian cockatoo can live anywhere between 90 and 100 years. Wow, 90 and 100 years for a cockatoo. That's long. But like we said, parrots, I know that parrots are long lived and uh, 90 years is a long time. Manusha and Palace, you've also said that, uh, that parrots are the longest lived um, birds. I would imagine that people would know how long parrots live because we use them, or we use them, we have them as pets and uh, I suppose that's a very accurate account as to how long these birds live. It would be difficult to have a martial eagle as a pet, the thing would run and rip your face off every day. Ah. One rare animal that you have to go and have a look at right now is Brent Leo Smith in an area with some good signal. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome back onto the vehicle. And uh, we've got good signal and that's about it, I'm afraid. Uh, there's not a living soul about uh, in this part of the Mara at the moment. Just lovely golden afternoon light and the light is Absolutely spectacular tonight. Very, very, very nice to look at. Very, very pretty. And I am heading now down towards the Mara River. And we'll see what's happening around there. Who knows? Maybe old Scarface has crossed the river. Or the Paradise Pride are about. Or the Mogoros are lounging about the Mogoro drainage line. Uh, the reason I came to here is actually looking for... That big male lion that I've seen a few times, he's got a very distinctive big scar in his nose. And uh, he does tend to hang around here. So there's a, a big patch of gardenias behind us. Sort of the only shade in this vast open plain. Uh, and often after a hot day like today, it's a very good spot uh, to find uh, a lion having a snooze. Alas, today it was lionless. And I think we're in luck. There's not much wind, so maybe we can find you some birds. Oh, what was that? Sorry. Alice, can you go again with that question? Hi, Debbie. Uh, Debbie's wondering any word on where the buffalo herds are. Now, uh, Debbie, the buffalo are, are permanent residents of the Mara and they spread out. I think you mean the, the wildebeest herds. Uh, we actually saw some small herds today uh, down in the southeast, uh, but most of them have crossed south into Tanzania already. Um, and they are in, a lot of them are in the Lamai Wedge. And actually, no, I think they passed the Lamai Wedge now. They've crossed the Mara River there and are now splitting into the western corridor uh, and the eastern corridor herds and the central corridor. And they're all slowly making their way down towards um, the Ndutu Plains in Tanzania. And uh, by the time February comes, all, most of them will be there and they'll be birthing there uh, before in about March they start moving. March, April, they start moving back north to the Mara. So it's going to be, they're going to be visiting Tanzania for a while, keeping the lions and the cheetahs of the Serengeti well fed, while our lions and cheetahs um, have to make do with what's left behind. Oh, there is a lot of game still here. Thumb 
would like to know how many times a month do lions hunt or need to eat? Hang on, hang on, hang on. This is without my binoculars. What have I got down there? I just saw a strange patch of dust. It's a car. Um, so, on average, lions will probably hunt twice a week. So, in a month, or maybe, no, oh, let me rephrase that. They will hunt many more times than twice a week. Uh, on average, they'll probably be successful twice a week, depending on the size of their prey. Let's call it three times a week. Uh, um, because they're probably going to be hunting smaller stuff here. Yeah? They're hunting buffalo and things like that, so they don't only have to hunt once a week. So, it's all very dependent on what prey is available. There's no right or wrong answer to it. But we can work out on averages, let's say three to four times a week. So we're looking at probably successful. Now they hunt, but they don't succeed. They only have a success rate of about 10, 12%. So um, it's like now four times a week, be generous that they succeed. So you're looking at what's that, 16 times in a month that they will, they will hunt. Some prides more successful. And again, it's really dependent on what they are hunting for. So if they're eating small warthog, they're going to have to hunt more frequently or impala or, or etc. But if they're eating buffalo, then that should be once or twice a week that they need to hunt. Oh, BSK, Manu. There we go. It might be a new one for some of your Mara bird lists. A BSK, which is an abbreviation for a bird. I wonder who can tell me what BSK stands for, if you know what BSK stands for, hashtag Safari Live. What is a BSK, apart from a bird? If anyone says bird, you're being silly. Bye, BSK. Take care would like to know why are feathers generally splayed out at the tips of a bird's wings? Well, there's a couple of different reasons. I, I'm not sure whether you're referring to that. that. They're actually splayed, but it'll also depend on the bird and when they're flying. So they will be able to close in and make it more streamlined or less streamlined, whether they're landing or taking off. But it's all to do with helping them uh, with flight. So they're able to control that same as their tail feathers. Now, when they get, they do get quite worn and sometimes you can see splaying of the feather actually splitting off the quill. Uh, and uh, when that happens, uh, it's generally could be from strong winds because those ends of the feather are taking quite or are doing a lot of work and are right in the full force of the wind. Okay, we're now moving down to the skull. Oh, sorry, not to the south, to the north, but down towards the Mara River ahead of us. Well, it sounds like Jamie's got a pretty bird as well, so let's go have a look what it is. Pretty birds, I'm afraid. No, no pretty birds here. <laughs> Alice is saying it. She was talking about me, which is terribly sweet of her, but also <laughs> I now feel inclined to try and stop for a pretty bird. It's, there must be a roller somewhere here. We've seen so many today. Very, oh. No, I don't have time. I want to, but unfortunately I can't. Plus it flew away. I'm gonna try and stop for a lilac breasted roller for you all. It is crazy how dusty it's got here. Dare I say we need a little bit of rain. Keep things nice and green. Sorry Zebbies. Places to go. Now for the past hour and a half, all I can think about is just how kind Rebecca's been to us today. So Rebecca's taken it upon herself to make us pizzas. Oh, we don't really get pizzas out here, as you can imagine. It's not something that happens. And you'll find that whenever we go on leave, a lot of the time one of the first things that we eat is pizza. 
and I'm so excited because Rebecca's managed to find herself access to the pizza oven used by the lodge and has prepared, she spent the morning preparing dough. Oh goodness. Jumbo! Hi guys. Hi. Any rhinos? I haven't seen any. I heard, I mean, I heard there were two by Ololo yesterday, but that was yesterday. Cool. All right, well, from a on the other side. really? Yes. Well, good luck, guys. I hope you've managed. Yeah. Hi. Shame. Very sweet. Anyway, as I was saying, Rebecca's making us pizzas, which we're very excited about. And it's very, very kind of her. We're just at that stage where it's a little bit too early for us to be looking at the beauty of the sunset. I think it's going to be a spectacular one this evening. I will tell you that across in South Africa, Steph is taking the time to admire the setting sun there. Now definitely where Jamie is, the sun is a bright orb, but we've got a lot of this moisture in the air and it's giving us this fantastic view. So just enjoy this and uh, if it's sunrise or sunset or wherever you are today this makes for a fantastic today screenshot and put it on your desktop as a screensaver and you can look at this for the rest of the day every time you walk into your office or walk into your bedroom or walk into your house or wherever you, see, wherever you can display this picture it's beautiful as the sun comes out from behind the cloud there Lots of Franklins calling, Crested Franklin, Cokie Franklin. Wind is still howling. Very nice, very peaceful. Sang, you saying the glorious African sun. I must agree with you, I quite like this. This is looking good. This is a nice glorious African sun. Not quite the sort of sunset one would expect this time of the year. Coming to the end of our dry season is usually typically this slate grey sky with a bright, hot, burning sun. It is lovely. Saying, another comment from you saying, nature at its best, and I think we all can agree with you on that one. It's just, there's something about watching a sunset. You know, having lived in the city for a little bit, and traveling all over the place like we do thankfully and much appreciatively you get to see a lot of sunsets in a lot of different areas but you don't always sit and appreciate a sunset and actually just sit and marvel at how beautiful it actually is especially when mother nature puts on a show like this for us some clouds in the air some trees and dry bush for you wind blowing really nice Richard, you'd like to know if we've got aeroplanes out here. Um, do Wild Earth have aeroplanes? No. Um, are there aeroplanes that fly in here? Yes. Uh, there's small little, sort of these light aeroplanes owned by, by private companies doing charter flights in here. Um, and then there are some private landowners here that do own their own planes. Uh, just to the south of us, there's a landowner with his own aeroplane, and so they fly around. 
Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different aeroplanes around here, but we don't own one yet. One day Wild Earth might own a plane with all the places that we're going to be growing to. Who knows what is uh, what is installed down the down the drag for us. Certainly would make getting from place to place easy, yeah. Uh, I think that that's a piece of plastic blowing in the wind, and if it's not, it's a massive snakeskin. I think it's a snakeskin. Wow. Is that a snakeskin? I'm going to go and fetch it. <laughs> Megan, I'm going to go fetch it, but it is probably a five-minute walk away from here or so. So, I'm going to speak to you a little bit more, and then when we've uh, lined up Brent or Jamie, we're going to send you across them at some point, and I'm going to go and fetch that and show you if it's a snakeskin or not. The curiosity is killing me. I can't help but want to go and see what is out there. Snakes, of course, shed their skin. Um, because their skin doesn't grow with their bodies and as soon as they reach a certain size their old skin will loosen up there's a fluid that gets secreted it'll loosen up and then it will um, it will the snake will be able to hook it uh, on a thorn usually and then pull it out inside out like a sock basically that you take off pull it inside out like a sock and it will stay behind almost entire like that but that is a big snake skin up in the top of that tree if it is a snake skin it's going to be interesting to see what it is have a look at this little bird here Senzo if you don't mind this one sitting right here in the, in the tree next to us uh, right there that is a uh, a little bee eater and there are two of them there Look at the lovely colors. Oh, we have to try and get a screenshot of these little birds. Oh no, what did I do? In my, let's see if we can go forward a little bit. In my eagerness to want to get you a shot of those little beaters, I ended up chasing them away, which is terrible. But those were two little bee eaters. And uh, let's see if they come back. All right, I'm going to go fetch that snake skin. Brent is ready to uh, to hold the fort down with some updates from tomorrow while I run there and run back again. And I'll be back in a minute or two with uh, the snake skin for you. Welcome back to the just absolute beauty that is the Maasai Mara. And as I say, that animals have not been on our side today. Uh, all the animals we've found like where, where the gremlins were living. The white hyenas, the lions just now, and the and foxes. But I am an eternal optimist that our luck is going to change as evening sets and we're going to find something magical, fantastical. So this is actually the very spot where Dave saw his first caracal ever. It was right around here and it was hunting through the grass and then disappeared into the forest. So let's have a look. Any caracal? Caracal? No caracal. Keep moving. Onward. Now, it, today was one of those actually quite fun days that, that happened completely by accident. So we, I got the report from one of the Angama guides about the mating cheetah down near the Tanzanian border. And it just happened the day before we had tested signal down there in that area and we found we had signal. So very excited. And I mean, I've only seen mating cheetah a handful of times. And um, so we were chatting and Taylor said, well, I've never seen mating cheetah. I'm going to come along. So I said, Karibu sana, jump on the back, off we go. So off we, off we trundled and we, we got down there. And of course, very disappointing not to see the cheetah. But we were really, really lucky. So you definitely see more mating cheetah than you see leucistic hyenas. So that was, a, that was a really big treat for all of us. And it's not often these days that you get a sort of a really big first like that um, to, see, to see something 
as incredible as that. And as I say, we are working on extending our, our, our reach into that area. So I'm pretty sure, sure, hopefully before the end of the year, we will able to be able to show you those desistic hyenas live. Speaking of hyenas, we are right on in the core clan lands of the North Clan. Uh, probably starting to get ready to head out on a night of foraging. Now, do we have any answers for what a BSK stands for? Uh, so badly wants to see a white hyena. Well, I can't show you one live, Riti, but you know what? If you missed the morning drive, I suppose it's only fair that I show you a picture. Now, we do have some footage that we will... Oh, I forgot. I took lots of photographs today. I didn't even realise. Keep, ooh, just keep going, keep, just keep spinning, just keep spinning the wheel. Oh my goodness. Aha, uh -huh. there we go. Just for you, Riti, and those who missed the sun, sunrise safari. How's that there, Manu? There we go. So there we go. Look at that. Isn't that incredible? So we saw two of them. This morning. Unbelievable. Literally unbelievable. Now, the very cool thing is um, I heard about them about six months ago um, when I first arrived in the Mara with... Um, one of our first meetings with the, the, the warden, um, Brian, he was like, look at these photographs I took of white hyena cubs. So they're about a year old, those two, they're three. We only saw two. Um, so it was very exciting. And I've been down there a couple of times and every time I see a hyena, I sort of start looking. And this morning we saw them at a really long distance. And we're like, I was like, could that be the white hyenas? Taylor and I both were like, is it the light? Mine was like, oh, is it the light? Is it the white hyena? Is it the white hyena? Has it got clothes? It's the white hyena! It's the white hyena! Oh, baby Topi. Tiny little baby Topi. Oh, they're so small. That's been born in the last couple of days. So September, October is birthing season for the Topi. Oh, hello, little one. Still wobbly. Now, baby topi are quite fun, um, especially if they get it in them. They take off on these mad games of chasing each other up and down and around the corner. Now, you see the mother there? It's uh, basically licking the baby's bottom. Um, and they do that to stimulate defecation. So um, especially when the babies are very young and um, with the milk diet, they can get a little bit constipated. So um, the, the females will lick their bottoms uh, to, to, to stimulate contraction and uh, get them nice and regular. Oh, sweetness. So local. Now, of course, baby Topi is a very high up on a cheetah uh, on their on their sort of hit list of favourite foods, um, and um, we're definitely probably going to see some interaction between cheetah and Topi. Now, often in some cases, the mothers will try headbutt and bash the Topi off. I mean, not the Topi, the the cheetah off their babies. So it could be quite interesting interaction to. In interaction to watch. Oh, it's just that magic time of the day and the sun is disappearing behind the Ololola escarpment. Look at that. Stupendous, actually.
Nancy has, says they have such long legs. Indeed they do, all the better to run away from a lion with. They're one of the fastest antelope in the world. Now, we're going to keep moving down the road. I am, so as I said, it was completely unplanned that we were going to stay out the, the whole day. So Jamie's just up ahead, and she's got my ranger, so we can stay out after dark. So she kindly brought him down the hill. So I'm going to go collect him, and then we can carry on on our adventure into the darkness. And it sounds like the winter farmer has managed to retrieve the snake skin from uh, the bush. So let's go see what snake it is. It was a snake skin, everyone. Look here. That's the head. It was actually hooked on by the head. Um, massive. This is the two scales over its eyes. The scales on top of its head. This was its bottom jaw. Where its bottom jaw was. And then its body was here. Now, this is a fairly long snake. I unfortunately broke it on the tree when I undid it. Now have a look here. There. That is a big snake. And this isn't even all of it. from the bonnet, let's measure it on here from this side, so from there to here to there plus a piece of the tail probably about this long, so probably about to here, so as long as this. That was that snake. Looking at it, it's really difficult to tell what snake it is. Just by looking at this, I don't know my snakes well enough to be able to see or tell you what uh, what snake's head that comes from. It looks like it could be, a co it's big enough for one, one of the cobras or a mamba. It definitely looks like a cobra or a mamba to me. That pattern of the scales on its lips and on its head here will be able to help you identify or help us identify the snake for sure. Maybe what we can do. It's awesome. My road, your music. You want to know how long it takes for a snake to shed its skin or to how big it needs to get in order to shed its skin? Um, basically, it, it depends on, on the 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 the, the amount of food it has and the environmental temperature. Given an endless supply of the right size food and a very warm temperature within, <coughs> within that snake's metabolic rate, it'll grow and shed its skin once a month. Given poor areas and where it can't find enough food, it'll only shed once a year, maybe even more than that, so, um, or maybe even less than that. So it all depends on food and environmental temperature, to be honest, but as quick as three, four weeks if you feed it underneath controlled controlled environments. Now what I'm going to do here <coughs> is look and see so what I what I want to do with you if I can is go here blind snake, thread snakes, boas, no 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 cobras so let's go to the cobras 106 And snouted cobra, which you find over here. Uh, thick snake, 17 to 19 smooth scale rows at mid body. And so, what we do here is we go to mid body on this snake, which will be. Where's my other piece of skin gone? Yeah. So mid body on, on this snake and we count the scales in a row. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 
10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 scales on the dot. All right, so that's 17, and now we go to Mumbers. And I want to have a look at the Mumbo, which is also this big, and let's see how many scales they have. <coughs> Excuse me. Come now, where are you? Mumbers. Now, because I'm trying to go fast, of course. Excuse me while I just do this. 110. It's actually just over the page. I could have done that easily. So black mamba. And scales in 23 to 25 oblique rows. Uh, yeah. So I think it's definitely the snouted cobra. So if I were to guess snouted cobra, and let me see if I can show you a picture of a snouted cobra. Play 20. Here we go. That one and that one. Snouted cobra. Scary looking thing, hey? Ooh. You can see the thick scales on its head there, and the thick scales on its lip. Let's see if we can see that. So hold tight. Let's put our snake. Let's do this. So behind the eye, we've got this scale here. That scale is this one here, and then two smaller scales here, behind the eye creating a space. This one goes down to the lip, and then on the lip, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So I think that this is a snouted cobra, just judging from all of these that we're seeing here. So, very cool. All right, so now we know where a snouted cobra lives, which is quite nice. Come back here and react to birds giving alarm calls. Awesome. That was actually quite a lot of fun. Thank you. I'll put that in my snack book and keep it there. Thanks, everybody. And uh, now we're going to send you over to Jamie, and we're going to carry on looking for something else to show you. Ciao. I wonder exactly what snake it is that Steph has found. I remember having an experience with him discussing the mumba skin that was brought back. So I wish him luck in counting the various scales. It's actually quite fun to do. I've really enjoyed doing that, is figuring out which snake it is from, from counting the scales. It's easy with cobras and mumbas and so on. It's, it's much more fun when you get the little snakes. But maybe it's just one of those things I enjoy. So we thought we'd stop quickly, since it would be very sad indeed if we didn't take time to stop and stare and enjoy the sunset. Beauty is plain to see. Ha ha. Plain to see, get it? Because it's the plains? No? Okay. Fair. Chandra laughed. Thanks, Chandra. It's good to have the it's good to have the backup. Oh there we go. We we can look one more time. I think that's a very good idea. <laughs> Since it appears to be devoid of life here. We've done the swap we needed to do. And we're all sorted out. Gremlins General, I think. 
I've seen some spectacular sunsets here. I've seen some spectacular sunsets in South Africa, but the, the scenery here is really, truly gorgeous. And especially, I've noticed, hi guys. There goes the um, David Sheldrick Wildlife Trust people, the vet unit. That's pretty cool. Um, the skies here are really gorgeous, and especially at the moment with the build-up of the storms in the distance, it creates these really impressive cloud formations. I've never been particularly good at spotting things in clouds. It's, my mind is a little bit too literal for that. Even as a child, I struggled to see shapes in clouds, but that one looks a little bit like a flying saucer, a spaceship. Uh, Alice tells me that uh, Brent has got another pretty sky. I have to I have to be honest with her. Given that we're both in the Mara Triangle, I'm pretty sure we both have the same sky, but let's go and see whether his view is better than mine. There we go. It is a beautiful sky from a slightly different angle uh, through a little copse of ebony trees. Isn't that absolutely gorgeous? Now, we're going to head west at the moment. And one of the things we've been doing today, which has been really fun, is um, taking the roads we don't often get to take. Uh, or we haven't been taking because we've been looking for the wildebeest and, and that. So it's been quite nice meandering through areas we don't meander through too often. And of course, one, one of the wonderful things about that is you literally have absolutely no idea what you could discover on your meanderings. Now, I still haven't seen or heard that if anyone knew what a BSK was. So I'm just waiting to... Oh, we have lots of responses. Well, Elaine and many others, apparently it was far too easy for you. Uh, indeed, a BSK is a black-shouldered kite. A beautiful little raptor. Um, very fond of open grasslands. So they do eat little rodents and things like that, but the majority of their diet is actually made up of insects, such as big grasshoppers and locusts. And uh, that's what they end up eating a lot of. Ah! Oh! There we go, another bird for the birders. One that we would have seen at Juma as well. And uh, it has a call that sounds like someone being naughty on a, rus a rusty, a bed with rusty springs. It is a Koki, <laughs> Manu is chuckling, <laughs> Taylor's chuckling as well. Um, the Koki Franklin, and their call is, is, is it, it sounds like, uh, like uh, some vigorous movement on a rusty bed. Um, but they are very, very pretty and quite shy and retiring. So it's quite nice to see one out in the open. We don't get to see a lot of the Franklin species too well here because of the grass and they just burrow into it just like that. And you can see how they disappear so quickly. Now, now I have asked Tristan to be keeping an eye for me. Let me just... Um, <laughs> So uh, I just got reminded that there's a school drive in 15 minutes. We will not be speaking about rusty bed springs then. Um, okay. No, I can hear them. I'm just trying to see them now. Um, but I asked Tristan to keep an eye on there. So we, we're going to try work out when some of the migrants arrive in the low felt. There they are. They're on top of that tree there. Uh, we not, might not be at the best visual of them. But so... It's another load of European bee eaters. They, yeah, they're hiding in the thickets there. I can hear them calling. So when the first ones passed was about, there they are. Oh, well done, Manu, excellent. So they're roosting here and they will spend a day or two, sometimes up to a week in the Mara, um, collecting and feeding as they move down south. But I, I estimated probably, what is the date today? Today is about the 4th or 5th of October, I think. I don't know what the date is today. That's the lovely thing about doing what I do. I don't need to know what the dates are. Just where the animals are, where the birds are. Um, so let me try to work it out. I think it's early October. So I say the first bee eaters should be arriving at Juma between the 20th and the 25th. Now, it all depends. It's never exact. Um, it all depends on what they're feeding on as they move. So if there's been big storms in the southern Serengeti and there's lots of insects, they might spend an extra couple of days there. The same goes as they pass through Zambia. But yeah, I say 20, 20, between the 20th and the 25th, um, we should have... Uh, 
European beaters at Juma, and we might still have European beaters here in the Mara that are still on their way south. Not all of them go all the way down. There we go. But they're done for the night, um, and they're going to be snoozing before, well, probably hanging around. And, um, well, maybe the first ones have beaten past us and we didn't even notice. So I think we must go ask the winter farmer whether he's seen any European beaters either at home in Hutzbrett or on Juma since he's been back in the Lowfelds. Um, just to answer Brent's question about have we seen European beaters yet, no we haven't, but it would be very interesting if Brent has seen those beaters for the first time today, mark today and let's see when the beaters do arrive and it will be interesting to see how many days it takes them to get down here. I predict about four days, four days to five days for them to get down here, let's see. Well, no, wait, let's, let's be realistic about this. So they can do about 80 kilometers a day. It's 5,000 kilometers by road uh, from there to here. So let's take it down to 3,000 kilometers, divided by 80 a day. No, it can't take them that long, surely. Let me, let's, let's put some, let's put some, names to it, I don't know, let's say 12 days, 12 to 15 days and then those birds are going to be here. Let's see what happens. This is very pretty by the way. There's a lot of moisture in the air at the moment, a lot of clouds, cloud go, the sun now setting behind a cloud bank with the tree in the background and some clouds over it that I can't actually see from, from where I am. It's too bright. Almost looks like Jupiter's great red spot that, hey? Watch how fast the sun is sinking behind those clouds. Count for yourself, you'll see a couple of seconds and that sun will be gone for today. Less than 10 seconds in actual fact. And then we can see a sunset. Make up, you want to know what's the rarest bird I've ever seen or what's my favorite bird to see on safari? Uh, they're two different ones. Um, and gone. The, uh, my favorite bird to see on safari at the moment is a, um, is a secretary bird. It does change from time to time. I'm prone to change my mind. But right now, it's a secretary bird. The rarest bird that I've ever seen is a um, <coughs> twin spot. Let me see if I can show you what one looks like. I mean, excuse me, not a twin spot, a fluff tail. 97. So that is the, the rarest bird that I've ever seen here. Is that little fluff tail. I saw it in the Lombombos. And the bird that I like seeing the most at the moment is the secondary bird, which I'm going to show you now. Mm. 162. That's the bird that I like seeing the most. The secondary bird, which there are a lot of in the Mara, and hopefully Maybe Brent can help me out by showing you what one looks like in the flesh. They're quite rare here where we are now, but they're definitely a common bird in the Mara. You see them all, all over the place. Beautiful birds. So that's for now. Um, as summer progresses, my favorite bird then moves to a, a violet-backed starling, which is another very beautiful bird. And uh, <coughs> I quite enjoy them. They're just super colors. Ah, now, my friend Brent is able to see the moon from where he is, obviously at sunset on a full moon night, the moon and the sun, moon, moon, moon rises, sun sets at exactly the same time on a full moon night and that is it tonight and Brent's moon has just risen.
Yes, I'm claiming this moon. Thank you, Steph. It's Steph, it's my moon. It's no one else's moon. No one else can look at it. So no one else can look at it. No one else can look at it. No, I'm only joking, of course. So isn't that absolutely gorgeous? As Steph is 100% correct, it is full moon this evening. And uh, you can actually see the craters. Now, contrary to popular belief, everyone seems to think on full moons, the predators head out and murder and mayhem all the poor little prey animals out there. It's actually the most difficult night for the predators to hunt. So it, that ambient light created by the moon uh, gives a lot of the prey species much better vision and they are able to avoid uh, a lot of the predators. But there we go. Well, where did this wind come from, you vile wind? It just started blowing. Can we get a bit closer, Manu? Look at those impact craters that, um, on the moon, especially the one down to the bottom right, so where a meteorite is whacked into the moon. Uh, that one looks a little bit more recent than the others. says that we should be listening to Harvest Moon by Neil Young. Um, I think we should be, what was that? Ballyhoo. Who saw the whole of the moon, I think the name of the song was. Ballyhoo? Was it Ballyhoo? Too late. Too far. I saw the whole of the moon. Yes, unfortunately I'm not going to sing. You will all stop watching quickly or put it on mute. We'll leave the singing up to our hairy canary, James Henry. In this area, we might get the sausage tree pride. Let's go again with that one. Sorry, Alice. So we've got a question coming in. The comms broke up. That is quite, quite a good question. Uh, David is wondering, does full moon ever confuse the birds or insects? I'm not 100% sure. I know it does confuse baby turtles. When they hatch, uh, sometimes they start heading away from the ocean um, because if the full moon is in the wrong spot. But I'm, I'm not sure if it confuses, actually I lie, it definitely confuses the odd dove. Um, when it's the bright moon outside and you're lying in bed, very nice and cozy, especially in the winter months. And um, you know you've got a good another two or sort of feel like you should be sleeping for a lot longer. And then you suddenly hear the first idiotic cape turtle dove. And you think, oh goodness, it's time to get out of bed. You look at your watch and it's one o'clock in the morning. Horrible little doves. But no, it, so it can, I think it can do. Um, but I know it, it, it definitely does confuse uh, baby turtles when they hatch. Why, when, when you are, if you ever are lucky enough to see a turtle hatching at night, you must be very careful where you shine your light because you can, uh, they could get very confused. So the reason is that they normally look for the, the reflection um, of uh, the moon or, or, or stars or, or just reflection of the ocean and that's what they go for. So in a lot of places where, where people have built uh, houses and, and developments right on uh, turtle nesting beaches, it, it's a bit of a problem because the turtles then head towards the light or the reflection of, of the houses rather than uh, towards the ocean. So I know lots of people work very hard. Um, there's actually a, a, a wonderful gentleman I met. Um, he does safaris to the Mara, um, but he is from Mombasa. And uh, on the areas of beach that are very well lit where the turtles nest, um, they spend a lot of time and a lot of late nights during nesting season um, picking up the poor little turtles and sending them back in the right direction. Oh, it's Impala. Sorry. So that lovely sort of half-light moment where you've got to sort of really double-check everything that you spot with your eyes. Now, the only thing we haven't seen today is the neck. So, who knows? Oh! Just to the Koki Franklin quickly. It's getting speeding up. And there we go, you can hear the sound of a Koki Franklin. And yes, Alice, I know there's a school drive coming. There we go, done. Carrying on.
Okay, so um, we're going to keep seeing what we can find and stay away from jokes about creaky bed strings. Uh, we're going to go across to Steph back on Juma and uh, see what's happening that side of the world. Well, we just want to say welcome to Mark West Elementary and all of you that are joining us for this afternoon's PM Safari or the Sunset Safari as we call it. The sun has unfortunately set already, but we are going to see a delicious moon rise. Now, I know you're only 9 or 10, but do you know what night it is tonight from the moon? I'm sure you can guess. It's full moon tonight, exactly. And what happens at full moon? At full moon, the sun sets and the moon rises at exactly the same time and we're going to see and watch that from here hopefully it's going to be coming up i hope it doesn't hide away behind too many clouds for all of you but who of you can tell tell me where do you think we are you are joined by myself steph today and by brent and we're coming to you from two places in africa do you know where we're coming to you from yes maybe no we're coming to you from South Africa, that's where I am right now. And Brent, my friend, is coming to you from Kenya, which is in the middle of Africa, on the equator. And they are one hour in front of us. Now that sounds a bit weird, but they are one hour in front of us. And it's because they lie, if the, if the earth is round like my steering wheel, they lie further east of where we are, and so they are moving away from the sun before we do. That sounds a bit weird that, hey, moving away from the sun before we do. But that also means that they're gonna get sunrise before we do as well. Now, what are we looking for? Now, I know that you are sitting in California right now, which means you're even further away from, from, uh, from, um, from Brent than what I am at the moment. See if you can find out how many time zones you are away from Brent who's sitting in Kenya. And you can, see, you can count them and see how many time zones you are away, how many hours Brent is, um, I suppose, who would be in front of you or behind you, it just depends on which part of the globe you're from. What are we looking for today? We're always looking for something exciting. Now there could be an elephant around the corner, there could be lions around the corner, there could be buffalo around the corner. I'm going to a dam just in front here where sometimes there's a hippo that sits and lies there and almost always animals come to drink at this time of the day. Whoopsie! Bumps, 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 bumps. Now Brent's got a special toy to play with on his car and he's dying to show it to you. Hello, hello, Mark West Elementary. Lovely to have you on your very own safari. Now my special toy that Steph is talking about is really heavy. It is my special homemade super spotlight. And you can see how bright it is. And hopefully with the super spotlight, we're gonna find you some really cool little nocturnal creatures. Maybe we'll find some hyenas. Maybe we'll find some lions, maybe a leopard. Oh, you never know what's out yet. Now, I think I, did I say, yes I did. I think I said nocturnal creatures. So I want you guys to tell me, and you got to tell your teacher, tell your teacher what nocturnal means. So if you know what nocturnal means, tell your teacher. I want to know who gets it first. Let me know what does nocturnal mean. Okay, let's carry on. Let's see what is out here. We're looking for lions and hyenas in this area. And uh, you never know, we might find a leopard, we might find um, an owl, uh, all the nocturnal creatures. Ah, there's a hint there. Hello, Gail. Uh, Gail would like to know, how long have I been in Africa? Gail, my whole life, I was born in Africa, I went to school in Africa, and I've always lived in Africa. Uh, my ancestors came to Africa in 1820, so they, my family has been in Africa for nearly 200 years. 
What have we got? It is, it is, it is. Is that what it, I think it is. Oh, it's a black rhino, guys. This is really exciting. This is one of the rarest animals in the world. There are less than three and a half thousand left in the wild. And it is a black rhino. I know it is quite dark. Let me see if we can see him there. There we go. Hello, Mr. Rhino. Now, this is the young male. I've seen him around here quite a bit. I'm just going to help Manu a little bit. and just put the light a little bit closer to him. There we go. Hello, big boy. Oh, little boy, actually, he's quite young. Look at that, isn't that fantastic? Now, they can be quite grumpy and quite dangerous, so you gotta be careful around them. And uh, with this very, very strong wind that's blowing, and the wind is going from him to me, so he might get a little bit upset. Um, so I'm just gonna keep my distance from him. And as I say, we're not using the lights too much. Um, there we go, we're gonna go into infrared instead. So those of you wondering, we're using special infrared lights um, that enable us to see in the dark. Isn't that cool? That's another one of the special toys we have. Hi, Nolan. Nolan would like to know what do rhinos eat? Now, Nolan, the black rhino is a browser. And what that means is he, oh, I know this one, it's got no tail. I've seen this one quite a few times before. Um, it eats leaves and branches, Nolan. But um, there's another type of rhino called a white rhino, and it only eats grass. Now. They're not really black or white. So there was a lot of confusion um, and that's how they got their names. And I'm gonna tell you how now. Um, so the proper name for a black rhino is a hooked lip rhino. So he uses his hooked lip to break off branches and, and grab leaves. Um, and a white rhino has got a very wide flat mouth that he uses for grazing. So, oh, the rhino's running away. There we go, he's suddenly heard, he will smelt us, he's decided, He's out of here. Bye. Doof, doof, doof. But so, what happened is, when the first European settlers, um, or the first Dutch settlers arrived in Cape, in the Cape in South Africa, there were black and white rhinos there. But they spoke Dutch, they were from from Holland, and they called a black rhino, well, they called the white rhino, there were no black rhino around the Cape, a Veit Mont Renoster, which means a wide, wide-mouthed rhino. Now, when the English came next after the, after the Dutch, they went, well, what is that called, you know? And they went, it's a Veit Mont Renoster, and Veit and Vit. Vit is white, Veit is wide in Dutch, and uh, they, they got confused and they thought they meant it was a white rhino. So these ones unluckily just became black rhino because the other ones got misnamed white rhino. But we are going to keep seeing if we can find any kitty cats or hyenas. But while we do that, Jamie has got a super moon to show you. Absolutely amazing moon this evening and I know that Brent and and Steph and myself have all stopped to look at it but I just couldn't resist showing you this moon one more time. It really is stunning. It's also making Jandre work very hard because the wind is howling which means that our entire car is rocking as the wind blows here in the Masai Mara. Lovely to be joined by the kids at the schools today. Uh, welcome, my name is Jamie and this evening Jandre is on camera with me so that's pretty much all you'll see of Jandre is his thumb. And we're going to go and search for some exciting nighttime creatures to show you. I agree with Brent, the possibility of a a lion or a hyena but who knows what else we might find Jackson you want to know how many animals might we see goodness 
I think we're going to see lots of animals. So out here in the Mara and in South Africa, in these wilderness areas, the place is absolutely teeming with life. So we could, and remember, animals isn't just something big and scary like a lion or an elephant. Animals is, can mean birds. We could find some of the nocturnal birds like a nightjar. So let's see what we can find for you this evening. So you'll see I'm using a spotlight and that is the way that we find the animals out here in the dark. And it's really, really easy to do because the animals have reflective layers in the backs of their eyes which means that the light shines back and you can see them really clearly. It seems that Steph has beaten us all to it. Let us race back across to South Africa because he's got something very big that likes to come out at night. Look at this huge hippo that we found in this dam. Now, hippo kill more people in Africa than lions do. Look at that big mouth! Wow! Amazing! They open up their mouth like that not because they need to eat trees or boulders the size of mountains. They open up their mouth like that specifically to fight. Males joust with one another and push against one another with their mouths. And the male that opens up his mouth the biggest and pushes the hardest, he wins. Isn't that amazing? Hold your arms out like a big hippo mouth and then push your hands together and see exactly how hard you can push against your friend. That's what hippo do. Now Madeline, you want to know how big hippos get? Madeline, hippos can weigh up to 4,000 pounds and even the biggest hippos go bigger than that even. So four to 5,000 pounds is big. It's like the car that you were dropped off in school today. That's how heavy these hippo are and their teeth their bottom teeth you saw how big their bottom teeth were the bottom teeth can be as long as my arm can you imagine a tooth as long as my arm and they have two of them that look like this at the bottom and then two straight ones and they push against one another and they try and hack one another with their with their with their teeth and that's how they win the competitions now, he's gone underwater there now. You can see that he's almost completely disappeared. And that is because they can hold their breath. Now, Avery, you wanted to know how long can hippos stay in the water for? Now, they stay in the water during the daytime when it's nice and hot. And at nighttime, they come out of the water to eat grass. They spend between four and about six hours or so outside of the water eating grass and then way before the sun comes up when it's still dark they come back and they come back into the water and they spend the day in the water. Sometimes they'll come out and they'll lie on the sand and suntan but most of the time they spend in the water. Now the whole time we've been talking he's been underwater. A hippo can hold his breath for seven minutes. That's a long time. There he comes up, blows some water out of his nose for seven minutes a hippo can hold his breath and when they're born they can hold their breath already for 40 seconds. Isn't that amazing? So a newborn baby hippo can hold their breath for almost a minute. Now you can do yourself a fa do it in the class, you can time it, hold your breath and see if you can hold your breath for 40 seconds. It's near impossible, I know I can't do it. Now this is a male hippo and he's alone because he doesn't, he's not old enough yet to have his own pod of hippos. Now Lily, you've asked how long do they feed for? Lily, they feed for between four and six hours in a night. Oh, sleep, excuse me Lily, how do they sleep for? Um, Lily, they sleep for, it's difficult to say because hippos sleep just like this. They sleep under the water and then they bring their head up, I'd say a couple of hours a day between four and about six hours a day they'll sleep but of course it's difficult to judge because sometimes hippo when you drive past they'll be sleeping under the water you think there's nothing here you drive on you don't time it so I've never really timed a hippo sleeping Lily but I would imagine it's around about anyway from two to about six hours a day I would think have a look at his eyes and his ears they're on top of his head so that he can do exactly what he's doing now and keep the rest of his body in the water 
just lifting his eyes and his ears and then his nose. All on the same level. Did you see that when he went under? It was all on the same level. They just eat grass, that's all. Now, Tara, you want to know how many babies a hippo can have? Tara, a, baby, a hippo can have one baby at a time, usually one baby at a time. It's not uncommon for them to have twins sometimes, but most of the time it's just one baby. One baby at a time, once a year, and they are pregnant for eight months, almost the same time as a human is pregnant for. So they're pregnant for eight, eight months, a baby is usually born outside of the water in some thick bush like in the background over there born outside the water they'll spend a couple of hours to a couple of days not very long outside of the water and then the mom will bring them back in and introduce them to the rest of the family where is this male's family he doesn't have one yet and it's because he's still a young male when he gets a little bit older he'll go to the closest river where there's some other hippos and he'll go fetch himself a girlfriend or two or even three or four And that's right, they are polygamous, which means that one male can have a pod of several females, rather than monogamous, which means they only have one female. Now who of you know what is the hippo's closest relative? See if you can guess it. Is it an elephant? Is it a rhinoceros? Is it a tortoise? It can't be a tortoise, eh? A hippo's closest relative is a manatee or a dugong, and next closest is a whale. Can you believe it? So hippos are closely related to whales and dolphins, and not to rhino and elephant. How amazing is that? Let's see if he shakes his ears for us to get water out of it. So just like you and me when we're swimming in the swimming pool, water goes into our ears, they shake their ears. I wish I could do that. Oh, Riley, you've asked me a question. How many hippos are there in Africa? Is he going to open up his mouth? Come on. No, come on, come on. Don't yawn under the water. We can't see your teeth. Come out. No, what are you doing? Why don't he do that? Riley, how many hippos are there in Africa? Oh, good question, Riley. I don't know the answer to that question, but there are some places that have lots of hippo. A place like the South Luangwa National Park in Zambia has 80,000 hippos in one river. 80,000. That's a lot of biscuits to have with your tea and your coffee, if you think about it. Um, I don't know how many hippos there are in Africa, but definitely not millions upon millions. Uh, they are threatened. They don't occur in areas that are not protected anymore. It's very rare to find a hippo that is living outside of a game reserve or a national park. Generally speaking, they're restricted. And that is because hippo and man are in conflict with one another. They're in conflict over the same resource. The grass that the hippo loves to live on is the same, grows on the same sand that people like to farm crops on. And when people take the grass away to grow crops to feed themselves, the hippo's got no other choice but to eat the crops. And then the man and the hippo fights. And we all know what happens there is the hippo comes off second best. But people have got to eat. And so we have game reserves where the animals live undisturbed. We don't farm inside here. And the hippos live here and are very happy to live here. This is just one hippo. Like I said, he's still too young to have any girlfriends. Uh, who knows how long they can live for, these hippos. Take a guess, is it five years? Put up your hands and see if it's five years. Is it ten years? Put up your hands and see who's it ten years. Why do we times that by three? Is it thirty years? Can he take us for thirty years? I think we're getting closer now. Is it forty years? Can he take us for forty years? All right, those of you who put your hands up for five years, you got it wrong, unfortunately. Those who put up your hands for 40 years, you got it right. So 40 years, that's how long a hippo can live for, sometimes up to 45. 
but 40 years is what they can live for. That's as old as me, you know. And I'm about as bold as what that hippo is. The hippo and I share something in common. We've both got big ears, although I can't flap mine, I wish I could. And we are both bald on top of our head. Other than that, I suppose if I turned my head like this, then I'd have my eyes and my nose on the same plane. <laughs> We're going to send you back over to Brent, three and a half thousand miles north of where we are in Kenya, if you haven't guessed that just yet, and he's on the search for some nocturnal creatures for you. Hello, welcome back, Charlie. Sorry, I haven't found a line yet, but I'm really trying. Hopefully with our super duper spotlight, we'll be able to spot one, Charlie. So I hope you're watching very, very carefully. Now, there are often lions in this area, uh, the sausage tree pride, that is the name of the pride of lions. So I'm uh, having a quick look here. The wind is starting to blow, which is actually good for a lion when, you're, when it's hunting, because the other animals can't hear them coming and can't smell them if they're coming the right way. But another thing we often see in this area as well is hyenas. So hopefully one of our nocturnal predators will make an appearance shortly. I do have my super duper spotlight. It's giving me big muscles because it's really heavy when I've got to swing it, but it's worth it. It can see about as far as a whole football field the light can shine. Maybe even a bit further than a whole football field. So I hear you guys are from California. Now, that's a wonderful place. I've been to California. Uh, you've got very cool birds in California. And uh, the coolest bird I saw when I was there uh, it was uh, one of your turkey vultures. I really like them, but it sounds like Steph's got something really cool to show you back in South Africa. So let's jump on board with him to see what it is. We promised you a full moon and one is coming up from behind that knobthorn tree. And look how beautiful it is. Now, you'll notice that those dark marks on the moon are not moving, it's not clouds. Those are actually dark marks on the moon itself. Here you go. Do you know what made those dark marks? Do you know what they're called? No? Yes? Who guessed that the dark marks are called seas? People long ago when they used to look at the moon, used to think that those were seas on the moon. Now, let's see if you think what made them. Did anyone guess that those dark marks were made by volcanoes? That's right. Those dark marks on the moon, those dark marks on the moon were made by ancient lava flows when the moon still had an active core. The moon nowadays though is dormant and the only thing that we can see are the remnants of those lava flows, those ancient lava flows. Now we call them seas but in actual fact they're made of rock that came from inside the moon. Isn't that just beautiful? You can see some clouds going across the moon Isn't that just amazing? Those clouds are obviously closer to home than what the moon is. Isn't that just lovely? See how the moon has risen so quickly and you'll get your first glimpse hopefully now of the moon rising above the clouds. Give you a nice glimpse. Now you see that big white spot on the right hand side? Now who of you have seen shooting stars? I'm sure you can all put up your hands and say you've seen a shooting star. A shooting star is a piece of space rock that came through space going very, very fast and hit our atmosphere and then burned up. And as it's burning, we're seeing the shooting star going across the sky. Now the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, so there's nothing to make the space rock burn 
And so the space rock slammed into the moon and there was nothing to slow it down. And it made this massive splash of sand that now radiates away from what we call a crater. Maybe if we're lucky, you can see the crater on the right hand side in the middle of the moon. Let's see when the clouds go. These clouds are not playing with us today, hey? They want to hide what I want to show you. Ah, uh, it's okay. We'll wait a little bit longer and see if the moon sticks its head out of the top of those clouds. How quickly did that disappear? Ah, Brent has managed to find one of his nocturnal critters he wants to show you. Enjoy. Well, we haven't been able to find the biggest nocturnal mammalian predator, but we found you one of the biggest nocturnal avian predators. This is a giant eagle owl or a verose eagle owl. To give you an idea, he's probably about 70 centimeters tall. Look at that, isn't that cool? Now, he's being buffeted by the wind. Unlike the lions who like the wind to hunt, owls don't like the wind to hunt because what happens is when the wind's blowing like this, a lot of what they eat, little rats and rodents in the grass, decide that it's not pleasant weather to come pop your head above ground. So they stay there. So he might have to wait a bit to catch his dinner tonight. And he's a very big owl, a very, very big owl. Now we are still hoping to find the lions or hyenas that are in this area. So I think we'll let the owl carry on sitting up there, watching for anything to eat. Joe would like to know, are the animals hiding in the bushes? Um, some of them will be, Joe, some of them won't. Uh, a lot of animals, especially animals that get eaten by lions and stuff like that, will actually do the opposite. They'll try to get away from the bushes. They'll try to stay out in the big open area of grass so they get a chance to see the lions coming from further away so they can make good their escape. So I think I'm going to go up ahead here in a little bit. I'm pretty sure I'll be able to show you some of the animals that are hiding from the lions and the leopards and the hyenas. And who knows, maybe we'll just find a lion instead. seems like Jamie's got the same plan as me. She's looking for the same lions, which means we've got the double the chance to find them. So let's go see Jamie, who's just behind me. It, do it doesn't just mean we've got double the chance of finding the lions. It means that it's a race. This is now a race between Brent and myself as to who can find you the lions first. Now, I happen to know these lions quite well, and I don't know where they are today, but I know where they like to be. I think Brent might as well. Now, the question is, which of us is going to get lucky? My bet is that Brent is going to go left. I'm going to go right. I know where I'm going. In fact, let's, let's just speed up a little bit. Or not. <laughs> Don't quite seem to have the power to speed up. Okay, let's keep going at exactly the same speed up the hill and we will find those lions before Brent does. Come on, don't turn right, Brent. Don't turn right because that's where I think the lions are. What do you think, kids? Who do you think is going to find the lions for you first? One of us should. Brent's got a head start, he's further ahead than me. But what he doesn't know is what I know, and that's where the lions were. Admittedly, two days ago. Oh no, he does know. Oh no, I've lost my advantage. I think I know where they are. Okay, everybody, you ought to hope that Brent, Brent's gonna go left, I'm gonna go right. That's what I think's gonna happen. Oh, don't tell me he's found them. He's stopped up ahead. 
Has he beaten me? That doesn't count. Quick, over to Brent. Well, here we go. Uh, we've got a very, very cool little nocturnal predator. It's called a genet. And they are, he's hunting for birds that are sleeping in that tree at the moment. So they look like a cat, even though they're not related to cats. Um, they're more closely related to mongoose and raccoons. And you can see they're very, very pretty, pretty little, little creatures. So he's trying to find a sleepy bird to eat. So they're expert climbers and they live in hollows in the trees or sometimes in, in, in holes in the ground. You can see how he's sniffing, sniffing, checking for birds. Hello, Lila. Lila would like to know why are the eyes of the owl so big? Well, Lila, it's so he can catch any spare light. Oop, up he goes, the genet. Um, so you can see better at night. Now, if we look carefully at that genet and you look under his eyes, where has he gone? Up. There we go. You can see there's a little white spot under his eyes. So that white is actually designed to catch ambient light. So light from the moon, from the stars, and that makes his night vision better. Oh, he's disappeared. Let's see if I can get his eye. Oh, there he is, up, up a bit. Oh, he's gone into the thickets there, looking for some birdies to eat. Ah, oh, there we go. Well, big jump. Oh, well, he's going right to the tip top of the tree, hoping to find an unsuspecting dove. But alas, I think he's got the wrong tree tonight. Okay, good luck on your nocturnal hunting, Janet. We've still got lions to find. Hopefully, we'll try our best, we will. hiding guys I need you all to think really good positive thoughts that we can find you a lion before the end of the drive and uh, it'll be hopefully just down the road here somewhere So while we are looking for nocturnal critters, so is Steph back in South Africa. So let's go see what he's managed to find with his spotlight. Uh, we managed to find our moon again. We didn't manage to find a lion yet, but if there are, t if there are two people that could find you a lion, it is Brent and Jamie. They are very, very good. Just have a look at that. That is a fantastic view of the full moon, isn't it? And on the right hand side, you can see where that space rock smashed into the moon many, many thousands of years ago and sprayed sand almost over the entire right hand side of the moon. Have a look at the moon disappearing out of the top of your screen. That is how fast the moon, well, we, the moon isn't traveling, the earth is traveling. How epic is that? We're not moving the camera. Ah. Now, Jazara, you want to know how far away the moon is from Earth. Now, Jazara, I'm going to give you a little fact about the moon, which is going to be quite interesting. The moon is eight light minutes away from the Earth. Eight light minutes. Let's see if you can figure that one out. I'll tell you in a couple of seconds. Sensor. Ah. So basically what Senzo is doing is he's showing you how quickly the moon moves out of the frame. And in actual fact, it's how quickly the earth is turning relative to the moon. We're turning at this point about a thousand two hundred 
kilometers per hour is how fast we're moving, is how fast the planet is moving. Isn't that amazing? Okay, now, Jazara, I'm going to answer your question about how far it, the moon is away from Earth. It's eight light minutes, which means that the light from the moon takes eight minutes to reach Earth. So the sun shines on the moon, the moon's like a big mirror, it reflects the sun back to us from its sand on its surface and from the sun shining onto the moon and then from the, sorry it's not eight light minutes, excuse me, that's the sun's distance from here. I've made a big mistake everybody, oopsie. <laughs> That is very embarrassing, isn't it? <laughs> All right, so we'll go into the next question. I'll explain myself in a little bit. Now, Lily, it's your birthday today. Happy birthday, Lily. I hope you're having a fun day today and, um, and you have a fun afternoon as well. Lily, you want to know how big the moon is? Lily, the moon will be able to fit into the Atlantic Ocean if we were to put the moon on inside our earth it would be able to fit into the Atlantic Ocean and if you've got a globe on your in your um, in your classroom you can then put your fingers between North America and Europe or North America and Africa and you can f it, the moon will be able to fit into the Atlantic Ocean between those two continents nice hey now to go back to explaining about light minutes. Now, I don't know, it's a couple of seconds, but the light from the moon takes a couple of seconds, light seconds, to go from the surface of the moon to inside your eye. That's how fast light travels, but that is how far away the moon is. It's over a million kilometers away from where we are standing at the moment. That is very, very, very far. It is lovely, hey? All right, let's carry on with our game drive. We also got to try and find you some animals. It's dark now, and all the predators like to move around in the dark. It's windy and it's overcast where we are. We look like we're gonna get some rain tomorrow, which we really need. This is our winter. It hasn't rained here for quite some time. Not any substantial rain, at least anyway. It hasn't rained here for quite some time. And we're looking forward to our summer which is just approaching now, around the corner. What am I looking for? I'm looking, just like Brent found that little Janet, I'm looking for the reflection of eyes in the light. And that will tell us that there's an animal there. And we can pick up our binoculars and we can look at what animal that is and hopefully it is something exciting to look at. Uh, if you want to know what we're looking for, if any of you have ever seen your dog or your cat walk towards your house in the dark and they have that eyes shining, or sometimes when you take a photograph and you see the eyes shining in the photograph, that's what we're looking for at the moment with our spotlights. Looking for other creepy scorpions and snakes and spiders, they'll all come out. Now that it's nice and dark. Alright, now I know which team are you on to find the lions first? Are you on Team Brent or are you on Team Jamie? And if you're on Team Jamie, she's busy looking for the lions fast now, you're going to go and have a look at what Jamie's trying to find you. Team Jamie! Woo! Thanks, Chandre. <laughs> we're looking for the lions. We're going to find the lions. Come on, lions. Okay, so they weren't where I thought they were. The thing is, that's, that's half the fun of being out here. They're wild animals. They go where they want to go, when they want to go. And sometimes they ditch us and leave us trailing in their dust. But we've still got time and this is their favorite spot. Come on, lions. Don't let me down. And don't you dare walk out in the road in front of Brent. That has happened to me a few times. Come on, lions. Oh, 
it sounds as though, although he hasn't found the lions, Brent is having a lot of luck with the nocturnal creatures. Well, yes, I said I was looking for lions and hyenas. I'm sorry I couldn't find you any lions, but I have found a spotted hyena. Here we go. Hello, hyena. Oh, waking up, getting ready to go out on a night. Oh, no, getting ready to go have a nap, a nap again. Napping in the road. So this is a, a, a group of hyenas. is called a clan of hyenas. And this clan lives right below our camp. And hyenas in the Maasai Mara do a lot of their own hunting. This clan hunts wildebeest and zebra in the rocks up in the mountains. And they even sometimes hunt something as big as a hippo. Let's try sneak a little bit closer. Jackson, hello. Jackson's wondering, do hyenas eat meat? Indeed, they do. They are what we call carnivores. So that means they only eat meat. They will sometimes eat a little bit of grass or something if their tummy's upset, but their main diet is indeed meat. Now, this hyena is looking very comfortable. It's not even moving as we get a bit closer. Staying, snoozing in the road. Now, out of all the predators, now the predators are what eat meat uh, that we get in the, the Maasai Mara and Antichuma. The hyenas are probably the smartest. Not probably, they are definitely the smartest. They are very clever animals. <laughs> Riley, hello. Riley would like to know how fast they are. Uh, Riley, they're not that fast. They, they probably they can run faster than a human being. But what their great skill is is that they have got incredible stamina, so they can keep running for very long distances. Here we go. Looks like he heard something or smelt something. Not too interesting. So you'll watch hyenas, lions, and lots of other animals will lift their nose. Even watch your dog at home. Look, look at that. He'll lift his nose into the wind to try and pick up the scent of whatever is interesting. Of course, according to this hyena, nothing is interesting. Now we're going to try to sneak a little bit closer again. Princess Pulum would like to know, have I had any dangerous encounters? Well, no, not since I've been at Safari Live. Uh, we're always very careful around the animals. Um, we do get some interesting encounters, um, but fortunately we try not to get into dangerous situations. And the way to do that is we're lucky to have a very experienced team um, who don't let themselves get into those situations. So there you go, there's the hy hyena again. Nonplussed by us at all. Oh, tired, Hina. You know, put your head back down. There we go. Doo doo time. Now, let's have a quick look with my spotlight. Often, where there's one, there's a few more around. Uh, it seems like this one's all on it, on his end. There are some zebra behind. So we're going to leave the hyena to keep snoozing on, but it sounds like Jamie has got something you saw with Steph, but this time it's outside of the water. It loves being out of the water at night because, of course, as I'm sure Steph told you, this is when hippos do most of their feeding. Now, where we are here in Kenya, we're very close to a very big river known as the Mara River. <clears throat> And at night, when we drive around here, we see so many hippopotamus wandering out of the water next to the road, often feeding together in quite big groups. And I see this one when I've followed and searched for the lions in this area. I've seen the hippos here. I, wouldn't, I don't know if it's this exact hippo, but I've seen hippos here regularly. They spend a lot of time around this area, munching away on the grass. You know, something that big only eats grass. 
Wonderful. I'm sorry, Team Brent and Team Jamie, neither of us managed to find you the lions this evening, but that's half the fun of being out here. If we could predict where everything was, it wouldn't be nearly as exciting, now would it? Uh, we've had a wonderful evening, and you never know, the lions could come strolling past us in the next 40 seconds, but to be completely honest with you, I don't think that's going to happen. The wind is howling, the predators will be hunting tonight using the wind sound to hide all of their stalking. Right, it is time for us to say our goodbyes and our thank yous. Thank you so much to the school for joining us this evening. I hope you kids all had fun, even if we didn't manage to find you the lions. And a thank you to Jandre for his wonderful camera work, as always. And most importantly, thank you to all of our viewers, our crew back in Juma, and our crew up in the Mara Final Control. Thank you.